Oh boy, the moment I go live, it becomes red. Good going, me. If anybody just logged in, I am setting the stream up, and I have a very high CPU rate right now that is not good. I think maybe worse comes to worse, I'm just gonna not record this episode, because... Yeah, 96 frames dropped. That is amazing. How about I don't record? No, I hit stop recording. This program does not know when to stop itself. Absolutely brutal. Finally, maybe it lags, but okay, it's not recording, so I'm probably not going to do a highlight for this week, unfortunately, so <laughs> yeah, I don't think this is really much of a abridged series type game for me. Like this one I genuinely enjoy learning and discovering, so I will stay up on the channel and just do it thing. So, excuse me as I finish my work that I'm doing to get this on the screen. <laughs> Perfect. And the frame rate is still kind of bad, and... Well, not the frame rate. Is it the frame rate? At least the Minotaur Hotel thing has a weird frame rate. 59 frames dropped. Oh, great. <laughs> this is just getting more and more enjoyable. I know you all are excited for me to play Minotaur Hotel. I revealed which one won already, so... <laughs> Pretend you didn't hear that once I actually start the stream. At the moment, I'm just checking for kind of quality control. The quality is out of control right now. <laughs> so we'll start in like a minute. I just need to see if my computer is absolutely murdering itself just to run everything. Stream quality is quote unquote good. <laughs> oh boy, 26 frames. Better than the nine frames that one time. All right, should I go now? Should I? Should I risk it all and actually try to get this thing going, or will it all fall apart? All right, we're gonna start at the four minute mark, why not? Maybe it's a streamlabs issue, maybe my computer's just getting old and I need like more of a PC gaming computer to record. <sighs> I need to figure this out. Cause this boy's been getting a few years old. It's a used computer too, so probably is older. Am I live? There we go, we're live. Perfect, with 10 seconds to spare. Alright everybody, welcome back. I am Dirk the Red Panda, and this is the Minotaur Hotel. And yes, I'm back at home for this weekend, hence the terrible lighting. I I can't just bring my lighting equipment back and forth with me in my one car, which, you know, already has enough luggage whenever I come up and down, so... Yeah, unfortunately I couldn't bring down any better lighting with this for now. But, on the bright side, I will be back at my house, or my apartment, I mean, after this weekend, and within a month I'll be moving back here more 
permanently and be able to bring that lighting equipment down, so at least I have some better lighting equipment that I can put in front instead of behind, like this. So yeah, that's what's going on in my life. How about you guys? Oh boy, we're in the orange, baby. 26 drop frames, last two minutes. I'm gonna turn off the dual screen setting. Oh, I got so excited I forgot to say hello. Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> hello, Jason. Yeah, the music is always really good for Minotaur Hotel. Not gonna lie. This is version 0.4 still. I bet it's updated sometime, but I don't think I'm gonna get that far to play the entire thing. Unless I binge this entire game. Hmm. Food for thought. Alright, so. Let me go to the continue option. We are tech, because we are nerds. Oh, we're in chapter 5. I was like, is it 4 or 5? Of course I get it wrong. Here we go. Time to change the title. It, it's it's all incorrect now. This is totally all of ours. Gotta go back. Change it all. And also let me know if the music is too loud for my mic or whatnot. Or it's cutting over me so I can lower it. Uh... <laughs> I'm messing around with everything. This is so much fun. Okay, I'm gonna just get rid of the text edit file that I used to paste the description, which has the uh, game link in the description if you want to play it yourself. I totally recommend it and enjoy it for yourself because there are so many different combinations and whatnot in Minotaur Hotel, so lots of good stuff. Anyway, are y'all ready to get started? Because I think I am. I, I can't hear you. Y'all ready to get started? <laughs> Alright. Fine, I'll start in like half a minute. <laughs> I need to spend 30 seconds typing it into here. I should probably say the reading begins from now on instead of the reading starts. Ooh, that sounds much fancier. And hence, a new trend was born. I would turn it down slightly. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I put it on a slightly louder volume. Wow. Good catch. Uh, who said it? Uh, Fallen Wolf. Thank you, Fallen Wolf. Great to see you here. As usual, you have your own channel of things. I'm probably gonna do about 40%. Alright, let's continue. Oh no, I went over the time limit again. Ah, 8.30. Screw it, we're doing it live. Alright, 10 seconds, everybody. Let's get going. Yeah, and it doesn't get updated too often, so no rush. Gotcha. Alright, 3, 2, 1. 0. Alright. You wake up to the sound of Asterion's hooves clicking on the wooden floor right behind you. Good morning, master. I'm sorry for the noise. It was not my intention to wake you. Snuggled up on the couch with a blanket covering you, it's easy to ignore the Minotaur's words. Were it not for the sunlight shining directly on your eyes and the smell of breakfast, you would have fallen back asleep. You peel yourself away from your blanket's warmth. You give Asterion a dopey smile as you step up and neatly fold the blanket before leaving it on the couch. I, I slept very well, thank you, Asterion. Oh, that is a relief. Well... I went ahead and made breakfast for you. At times, it is easy to forget how exceptional are the circumstances you find yourself in. Waiting for breakfast is such a mundane thing, but all it takes is a glimpse at a stereon for the facade of normalcy to fall. Ah yeah, we gave him the awesome V-neck tech. And basically pulling a meta joke on the shirt. I love it. Uh, Python. Good stuff. 
It is easy to find Asterion's quick healing jarring, more so than the hotel itself. He already stretches the clothes that seemed too big yesterday. I see this shirt fits you better. Do you like it? Yes, I love it very much. I very much appreciate the gesture, Master. There wasn't much left in my wardrobe, save for my old clothes when Jean Marie was my master and an old Perizoma. Perizoma? Ah, I must have slipped. Uh, I'm sorry. It's an old style of loincloth. It's what we wore back in Crete. No need to be embarrassed. Uh, I'm glad you like the shirt enough to wear it again. Uh, perhaps it is fitting that I have more modern clothes to wear. Today might be a special day. Now that the hearth is lit. Very, very lit. Guests may find their way to the hotel again. I want to make a good impression. Maybe the clothes I picked are inappropriate. I wouldn't know. It has been a long time, after all. What should I wear today, then? To dress a stereo and select one of the categories on the left side of the screen, and then select the clothes you want a stereo to wear on the right. When you're done, click the finished button. So, select one of the categories on the left side of the screen. And when you're done, click the finish button. Oh, okay, there it is. Awesome! Oh, this is gonna be so much fun! What does this do? Nude! <laughs> I should be going to horny jail. Fuck. <laughs> I'm a bloody heathen. <laughs> oh, not fully nude. He still has a loincloth. Sorry if anybody wanted to see that. You want to see it? You want to see it? Did you like it? What was your favorite part? All right, I okay, can't. I'll just. Given my 40s outfit, why the heck not? Let me see. <gasps> it's Samuel! From the smoke room! Oh man, I should have been recording this the whole time. Well, maybe the music is quiet enough that I could edit this in somehow. Or get Shin to edit it despite it not having separate audio channels. Sorry. TS. I need to go to horny jail. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> yeah, Staren got a tan. <laughs> so, the only clothes we got are 40s outfits. Oh, lower clothes for... Oh, that's why I was talking about a loincloth. <laughs> what if we did none? No one will know. I wonder if this will, like, determine something in a later scene. It's like, he takes off his pants for some reason or whatever. <laughs> it's like he's forgot that he's gone for commando. Oh, no. Back to horny jail I go. God damn it! <laughs> I hate this so much. <laughs> Do I have, like, a safer work setting on? Like a... Why am I like this? None of y'all can see. All right, back to the safer work mode. <laughs> For anybody who is wondering what it said, you know all my videos on this channel are very Christian indeed. So, no nudie bits. 
None. Whatsoever. So, I would say the 40s outfit would fit better for this time frame. <laughs> Even though this is something Samuel would wear in 1915. <laughs> I honestly like the look, though. Hmm. Are there any other options? So if we went back to the modern shirt, it'd just be that, so. I honestly think the 40s look would be better for now. All right. Y'all ready to finish? All right, let's finish. Confirm selection. I need to figure out how to do a pop-up like that. Perfect! You look amazing! Alright. Should I wear my old clothes then? Yes, uh, white shirts will probably never go out of fashion. I mean, the pants are a little old, and people rarely use suspenders outside of formal occasions. But I think you look quite elegant with them. Yes, he does. You catch a tone of pink on his left cheek, well, where the fur is still growing back. I quite appreciate the compliment, Master. These clothes are very dear to me, and it pleases me to hear they are still appropriate in this day and age. Now that the matter is settled, I shall interrupt your breakfast no more, Master. You begin your meal. Asterion sits at the other end of the table, occasionally inspecting his appearance. When you look up from your plate, you catch him grooming his fur here and there. Once you are done, Asterion bows and takes your plate. And vanishes from thin air. As he carries it to the kitchen, you see him pick at some of the scraps and eat them. Hey, I was going to finish those! No, I kid. A uh, short while later, he returns. Do I have the master's permission to go down and inspect the hearth? I want to make sure everything in the hotel is working properly. Sure, I can go with you. Everybody trying to win over a stereo and be like, Really? Yes, I mean, we're, if we're having guests, maybe I should help with the inspections. See where everything is and all? <laughs> Very well. Please, follow me. Follow me. <sighs> Kota 1, Journey to the West. I guess that's the end of chapter five. So, uh, ah, gotta type it in. Coda one. I guess I'll just benchmark these parts. Why, why the hell not? Anyway, the light plays through the verdant leaves above, casting flickering shadows along the forest path. To either side, trees sway in the light breeze, whispering their secrets to each other and the traveler passing under the mighty bro... The, the mighty bros. The mighty bows. Or bogs. I don't know what that means! Oh, we meet this guy. Oh boy, we're meeting a dragon character. I know who it is. The dragon hums a quiet, simple tune to himself. His deep rumbling bass a counterpoint to the rustling of the leaves above. Through his travels during these long, lonely years, he's come to appreciate the sounds of the wind around him. Or the world around him, too, sorry. He's learned how to tune himself into them, letting them flow around him like the river from which he was born. They are his companions, constant and dependable. They fill the silence. They bring peace to his mind and heart during his long, seamlessly ending, seemingly endless search. 
As he walks, his humming trailing off as the wind dies down. He reaches into the bag slung over one shoulder and pulls out a plastic bottle of water. His deft, clawed fingers quickly unscrew the cap, and he tips it back to let the life-bringing substance pour into his waiting maw. It never ceases to amaze him how many conveniences like this had popped up over the years. When he first started his journey in the land of his birth, clean, fresh water like this was an almost sacred commodity. Something to be rationed out and stretched to the last, to the last little drop. Now it can be bought at a pittance. His thoughts turned to the young man at the store in the small town he'd left earlier that morning, who had insisted on packing his bag full of water bottles and snacks for the road. Richard was his name, and he was the co-owner, along with his wife, of the hiking supplies outpost where the dragon had spent the last few days. He worked, and they provided food and shelter. That was the agreement, similar to the ones he'd struck all along the winding road behind him. And when the time had come for him to leave, as it always did, Richard had shaken his hand and patted his shoulder and wished him farewell like an old friend. A cherished friend. And yet, Richard was blissfully unaware of the simple fact that his guest was not human. The charm he kept hidden maintained a disguise of humanity. Gretchen, Richard's wife, and better half, the man had always said with a wide grin, had fussed over the dragon. A nice pair of hiking boots would do better than the old, worn sandals on his feet, she'd argued. He's got the, what the heck are they called? Like, was it the, was it like the docks somethings or whatever? Like those brown, like, boots or whatever? Aren't they becoming getting into fashion again or whatever? I forgot. Anyway, the dragon had only laughed. They'd done more than enough for him, and had both his gratitude and his blessing, before leaving the two of them waving from the door of the shop. He hadn't looked back to them. He never did. The dragon shakes himself out of his thoughts, caps his water bottle, and drops it in his bag. He has no time for a reverie. By the shadows on the ground, it looks to be somewhere around late afternoon, and he has far longer to walk before the day is done. His name is Kota, and he is a drifter. However, his travels are far from aimless. The dragon is searching for something dear to him that was lost a long time ago. If this game says it's virginity, I swear to God I'm gonna slap it! As Koda wanders along the path, listening to the soft sounds of nature all around, his ears begin to pick up a quite familiar noise. As familiar as his own breathing. A river. Le River. Before he can stop them, his feet take him to the source of the sound. He leaves the trail behind, slipping through the undergrowth and leaping over fallen logs with a sinuous agility that belies his size. Finally, the trees give way to the sight of a winding, burbling stream. It's shallow, but Coda doesn't mind. He steps out of his sandals and takes a seat on the riverbank to slip his tired feet into the rushing water. It's warm. So warm. Old, half-forgotten instincts fill his breast, making his dragon or making the dragon's breath hitch in his throat. It's been so long since he's had a proper bath in a warm river like this, and the need to feel the water's embrace itches over his scales and pricks at the far corners of his languid mind. Oh. His yakata, worn and smelling faintly of sweat and road dust, 
comes off first. Kota picks up the tune he is humming earlier as he folds the garment in his lap. Over and over into a nice, neat bundle. And then carefully set aside on the soft grass. The dragon looks around for a moment, ensuring he's completely alone, and then unwinds his fundoshi from around his hips with a same practice grace. Damn it! Of course he can't show it. He knows full well that there's no shame in his nudity. But centuries of wandering the new world have allowed modern sensibilities of modesty to rub off on him. None of it is helped by this age's laws. I'm looking at the YouTube guidelines! There was a time when creatures like him were free to plainly wonder the world of men. Nowadays, there are consequences to breaking the secret. When will you learn, Kona? When will you learn? Better actions have consequences! Koda can't help a quick, shameful thrill down his spine as he bears himself, even with no one else around to see him. Nonetheless, he keeps his clothes nearby, so he's within the charm's range. With a soft grunt and a half-hop, the dragon slips into the warm, flowing waters of the river. Ah... Oh, thank goodness. Thank goodness we have a conveniently placed rock. Otherwise, this would be too naughty for you. As soon as the water touches scales, his muscles relax and he sinks waist deep into the river. The low sigh escapes his lips in a slow, lazy exhalation and his main head falls back into the rest on the riverbank. He hadn't realized how bone-deep weary he'd become. But now, with the rushing waters caressing and embracing him, peace stills his mind for the first time in centuries. The warm currents feel familiar, like an old friend, an old lover, welcoming him to a home he'd left behind long ago. As he lounges against the riverbank, Feeling the hard, smooth pebbles beneath and the swirling, flowing river enfolding him, Koda grasps at that familiarity. He allows his mind to wander, along with his hands. Over his shoulders and across his chest, he, his claws picking at the ridges between his scales, What's the end of the sentence? Oh shoot, I did not mean to hit that. Down to his belly. Across his sides and hips. His thighs. As his pensive thoughts sink into the warm haze of his meditation, a finger brushes the soft-scaled lips of the silt or of the slit. At the dragon's crotch. Oh my god, we're getting to know anatomy! As it slips inside, teasing the sensitive inner flesh, that finger becomes someone else's. Someone from long ago. He can almost feel their breath in his ear, hear the low rumble of their purring voice. Koda's heart flutters along with his eyelids as the fingertip within him brushes against a spot that makes his toes curl and his breath hitch in his throat. I swear to god this was safe for work! <sighs> the slow, gentle caress of the river waters of his home isn't the only thing the dragon has longed for all these years. He can feel the flesh within, the hidden length of his manhood. Stirring at his thoughts, the desire, the need. With a long sigh, 
Koda reluctantly draws his finger out of himself and moves his hand back to his stomach. He rubs over his belly, up his chest to his neck. A half-remembered poem flickers through the dragon's mind as his hands scrub away the dust and sweat of his journey. I like to wash the dust of this world in the droplets of dew. With dewdrops dripping, I wish somehow I could wash this perishing world. His breath gusts out of his nostrils as his hands fall to his sides. The river takes over, stroking his scales and limbs with his current, its comfort, a pale echo of what the dragon longs for. Won't you come and see, loneliness? Just one leaf from the Kili tree. Basho, right? Who is this? A stranger? Kota's eyes snap open as his head turns. He didn't hear anyone approach, and yet there stands a man by the tree line. Oh, man with curly hair, I see. Sorry to sneak up on you like that. You don't mind some company, do you? Sounds like you could use it. I, I, uh, no, I don't mind at all. Please. The dragon schools his face into a welcoming smile and gestures the man forward with a languid wave. For a moment, Kota is worried that his nakedness might embarrass his impromptu guest, but the man settles comfortably on the riverbank nearby. The dragon scoots closer to his discarded clothes. Sorry, I had to. My... Okay. Still terrible lighting. Sorry again. I've been walking all day, and my feet are killing me. The stranger kicks his shoes off with a long sigh, and then slips his feet into the water much like Koda did earlier, downstream from the dragon which makes Koda smile as he gives the man a nod. Believe me, I do not believe you. I do not believe you. I can't believe you. Believe me, I do not blame you at all. I myself have only stopped here for a moment's rest. <laughs> it's a nice place that you found, even if it's only to rest for a moment. Where are you headed from here, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, here and there, I'm more of a wanderer, you see, and you are... The dragon looks to the stranger with a polite, but expectant expression. In my new clothing, <laughs> I feel so different I must look like someone else. Ah. A fellow fan of Matsuo Sensei's works, I see. That's right. My friends call me Jean. I was making a delivery, but I got... Just a bit lost. Just a little bit. Is this Jean Marie, or is this just Jean? We'll find out. The man rubs at the back of his head with an embarrassed laugh and Koda lets out a soft chuckle. Ah, <laughs> but it's when we are lost that we are most easily able to find ourselves. <laughs> of course, it's easier when we have some help. I'd be glad to lead you back to the road, Jin-san. Uh, thank you, Mr... Ah, Sumimasen, I am Kota. Well, it is good to meet you, Kota. And your help would be really appreciated. The man offers his hand with a wide smile, and Kota returns to shake Jean's hand as he's grown used to doing so with everyone he meets. However, he can't stop himself from giving Jean a short half-bow from his sitting position. 
Hmm. Uh, pardon me if I'm assuming, but you're from Japan, yes? Uh, hi. That's right. Uh, it's been a long journey from the lands of my home, but I have enjoyed this wandering. It is marvelous to see new sights, is it not? Like this river. The dragon gestures to the idyllic landscape surrounding them. The rushing, chuckling water and the wind of the trees singing a soft, gentle song. I'm pretty sure... Wait, Jin. I'm pretty sh I'm... It's Jean, though. Like, I, I, that's what you're talking about. Why would it be Jaya? Huh. I'm going crazy. Ah, singing a soft, gentle song. The large bows overhead. Providing a shade while allowing diamonds of sunlight to sparkle on the flowing surface on the river. The cool grass on the river's edge. I made my home in such an unspoiled river long ago. <laughs> Untarnished nature holds special significance to me. You and I may be able, er, you and I may be the only ones to have seen this place in years. <laughs> See how untouched it is. Smell the freshness of the air. Jean laughs. Well, you are certainly passionate, Coda. That's always good to see in a fellow traveler. I'm from Europe myself. Even there, places like this are becoming a rarity, sadly. Oh, but there's still so much to see. It's why I became a delivery man, you see. I guess you could say that the wanderlust is in my blood. It seems you too are a long way from home, Jin-san. I'm sure you've gathered many stories in your journeys from place to place. Uh, oh yes, more than enough for several lifetimes. I could tell you some of them while we walk, if you're ready to get going. The dragon rises to his feet, and the water flows down and off his body like a silken robe. With a groan, Kota stretches and then climbs back up onto the riverbank, completely dry. Allow me a moment to get dressed, and then I'll be prepared. And if you'd like, I've quite a few stories of my own travels that I can share with you as well. <laughs> sure, I'd much like that. I'd like that very much. I'm doing fine, Nathaniel, thanks for asking. The two exchange glances and nod. A spark of understanding and acceptance flickers between Kota and Jean. The understanding of two fellow travelers sharing the road with each other. As the two men walk side by side, their conversation and laughter fills the air. Jean relates the story of a particularly difficult delivery up to the side of a mountain. A trip that took the better part of three days. In return, Coda tells the man of all the places he'd been and all the sights he'd seen. Forests much like this one. Cities and towns, both ancient and modern. Even that one time with the rock slide. <laughs> oh, now that was quite the adventure. Jean laughs as he claps the dragon on the shoulder. Sorry, I just had an idea pop up in my mind. I can't stop thinking about March Madness, dang it. Somebody had a suggestion back when where they're like, we should have, like, categories or something like that. And Sorry, just a weird impromptu thought that just popped up in my head. I just have to type it down before I forget. Sorry, 
I just had to think about that. Anyway, quickly before we continue, uh, sorry. Somebody asked, Amaral asked, Hey Dark, any advice for someone who is about to face his college finals? <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> you're talking to a seasoned veteran here. Four years, oh, this is my fourth and final year, my final quarter is right now. Weird thing is that quarter system doesn't end until June while well, I see everybody else graduating and I'm just like... But yeah, with college finals, I would say just pace yourself. I'd say... Make sure you have a space to study. If you have a library nearby or whatnot you can access, definitely check that out. If you have a separate room as a study room to be in, definitely kind of camp yourself out there for like a good portion of time. For me, I like to spend a couple of hours, maybe four to like six hours for a study period if I'm really hooked on a subject that I'm really trying to understand or practice. But don't worry if you get tired out after, like, an hour or so, or however short of a time. Like, you gotta be able to just feel comfortable with your pacing, and however comfortable if you are better at long periods of time or just short bursts, you gotta kind of best suit yourself to that, and that will help you feel more confident with memorizing the material. That's what got me through these years. But yeah, one more final for me, and I don't even have to really study for it as much as just prepare a presentation. Yeah, anyway, let's continue on. Good question, though, Amaral. You know, finals are coming up for everybody in college right now. Dean laughs as he claps the dragon on the shoulder. Amazing. <laughs> You're a really well-versed traveler, aren't you? <laughs> well... <laughs> I've been on the road for so long that it has nearly become my home. Oh, I know that how I know how that feels. <laughs> Sometimes when I'm on deliveries, it feels like the only thing I've ever known. Wait. The man's expression shifts as he looks around. Finally, his eyes light up in recognition. Oh, so that's how I got turned around. I think I can find my way from here, Kota. <laughs> Thank you very much for your help. Oh, it was no trouble at all, Jean-san. <laughs> However, before you go... You want to ask me something, don't you? Sexual orientation? Ah, <laughs> am I that easy to read? <laughs> In any case... Have you considered? Have you ever encountered, uh, well, something that couldn't be explained? What do you mean by that? Well, it was quite a while ago. Back in Nyon, in Nyon I once encountered something most peculiar during my travels. <laughs> I have been looking for it ever since. It may sound impossible, but... A hotel. With minotaurs in them. A minotaur hotel, if you will. From a spring of warm water, I saw something extraordinary. It was... A dragon? <laughs> Looks at himself. I think I found myself. <laughs> Kota clutches his charm. Hey, he has red scales, a shade darker than blood. So, you have seen them? The man hems and her haws for a long moment, scratching at his beard as he loses himself in deep thought. Kota holds his breath, his gaze locked onto Jean, until the man finally lets out a gusty sigh. Oh, I have come across many, shall we say. Unique uh, things across my travels. Few things can hope to surprise me. But... I'm sorry. I wish I could help you. But I haven't run into anything like that. Oh. Hmm. Well, I suppose it was a long shot. Thank you very much for your company, Jean-san. Good luck with your delivery. 
the dragon turns to follow the road. Not looking back to Jean. As always. Until the man calls out. Although... When Kota looks to the man, Jean is combing his fingers through his short beard. He hesitates for a moment, as though getting his thoughts together, and then nods. Yeah, it should be around here somewhere. What should? Oh, sorry, my friend. There's a hotel around these parts that just recently re reopened. And I was wondering if you wouldn't be able to find what you're looking for there. Uh, hotel. Yes, uh, I heard a few stories about the place. Supposedly it is used to be the gathering place for an assortment of... Unique uh, individuals and things. I'm sure there are a few travelers there already. People like you and me, who are wandering around from place to place. I might not know where this thing you're looking for is, but... Maybe one of them will. Kota considers the man's words. They ring true, and it would at least be a start. A better one than he's had in at least a century. Well, I will not know until I try. Who will I? <laughs> Arigato gozaimasu, Jin-san. Gozaimasu. Arigato gozaimasu, Jin-san. The dragon gives Jin a low bow, and the man laughs and waves the gesture away. Be gone, gesture! It's the least I could do for a fellow traveler. <laughs> Good luck, Kota. And I hope... <clears throat> And I hope that you will find what you are looking for. <laughs> oh, Koda is so nice. I'm loving Koda already. The two part ways. Jean to complete his delivery. And Kota to continue following the road wherever it will take him. His eyes are on the horizon. The spot where Jean pointed when he mentioned the hotel. Perhaps there is someone there who will be able to help him. Someone who can give him some kind of lead. Or point him in the right direction to find what he's been seeking. Oh, also for finals advice, Trinix Slayer really does sum it up pretty well. Relax and revise. Exactly. Not, it's, you're not supposed to all just cram it at once. <laughs> but yeah. Anyway, I know it's finals for a lot of people. And so... Yeah, it's good to have that, because I remember panicking around this time of year myself, too, when I was at community college in the semester system. Anyway, let's continue back to Coda's journey, shall we? Or maybe, like so many times before, Coda will find himself disappointed. They say it's not the destination that matters, but the journey. In his long years of wandering... The dragon has grown envious of those who are able to believe those words. However, as he follows the road, Kota finds a renewed spring in his step. A small smile curls his lips, and once more the rumbling of a hum tune joins the sounds of nature filling the air around him. His heart feels light, lighter than it has in centuries. Lighter than it has ever been since it's first felt the scarring, scarring pain of his loss. Perhaps this is hope, he thinks. Hope for the long-awaited end of his journey. Oh, it continues. Wow, this is a long chapter. Hot. So hot. So goddamn hot. But not the heat has er, but not the heat he has been craving. This is dry. Lifeless. The land is cursed. The dragon trudges along the side of the highway. Tongue lolling from his open mouth like a panting dog's. 
His supply of bottled water ran dry long ago. And now, the sweat has been completely dried from both his yakata and his brow, leaving, his, leaving the desolation of the desert around him to seep into his bones and his breast. It feels wrong to the dragon, just like slipping into the flowing stream earlier felt right. How long has it been since he left Jean behind? It swims away, a fish darting just out of reach of his fingers. He was there in the forest, and now he is here in the desert. And there, looming on the horizon, is the hotel the man told him about. It rises up from the other side of a hill, looking almost out of place in the sandy expanse, stretching towards the horizon in every direction. The style is one that Kota hasn't seen in quite a while, quite a long while, in fact, and the despair, the disrepair the building is in is readily apparent even from the distance. It wasn't like the dragon was expecting a bustling hub, with polished and shiny doors never having a chance to swing close around the tide of travelers making their way in and out. But the place looks about as desolate as the surrounding desert. Still, Kota is here, and while the sight before him makes his heart sink just the smallest bit, the dragon still trudges onward. Down the sandy hill, working a sharp rock out of his sandal with his toes as he goes. Along the road, feeling the heat of a black top against the scales of his legs, curving slightly as he follows the driveway into the parking lot. Forward. Forward. Always forward. Kota struggles to make his way up the steps to the building's front door as the fatigue of his journey begins to set in. He has to stop, leaning against the wall to catch his breath. Up close, the hotel looks at least a little better. The dragon can see the places where the effort has been made to patch up the worst of the wear. The repairs look fairly recent. Someone has to be here. With a final deep breath, Kota pushes the door open. Hello? Hello? The dragon barely recognizes his own voice, as dry and dusty as it is. He coughs, hacking and gasping and swallowing to wet his throat, and then tries again. <clears throat> Hello? Hello? Sir, are you alright? Er, sir, are you alright? It's gonna be a stare in, isn't it? Before Kota can answer, another coughing fit rocks his weary body. He feels a presence rush forward and wrap an arm around his back, and the dragon is led forward into the cool hotel lobby. His host lowers him into a chair. The world blinks for a moment, and then a glass of water is pushed into Kota's hand. Kota haphazardly bows in gratitude before opening his maw wide to gulp down the cooled liquid. It's not much, but that little bit of moisture settles into and revitalizes the dragon. He swallows, holds the glass out to be taken by a large, fur-covered hand, and looks up at the host. It's Asterion! Oh, he looks so nice with him! Oh, look at him. They look so good together. Oh, uh, uh. Please pardon my intrusion, and forgive my shameful display. It is no trouble. I am happy to offer assistance. Oh, uh, thank you. The dragon takes a slow, deep breath, and then another. And another. The soreness settles into his weary limbs, fading slightly as it spreads through his body. Kota takes the opportunity to look around the hotel lobby, examining both the room and the hotel's apparent owner. Oh, uh, 
Pardon me. Welcome to the hotel, sir. I am Asterion, the keeper of this fine establishment. The master is otherwise occupied at the moment, but I would be happy to introduce you later. For now, please let me know if there is anything I can do for you, or any questions I can answer. Thank you very much, Mr. Asterion. I've heard about your hotel opening, and wish to see for it myself. And I must say, I am pleased. I have never seen a Minotaur in my life. I traveled all around the globe, seen all sorts of beings. But I have always thought Minotaurs were only a legend. The place truly must be special for such a rare specimen to be here. Although... The dragon looks around the empty lobby. The half-man, half-bull keeper seems able to easily read Kota's expression and offers him another low blow. Yes, the hotel reopened just recently, and we've only just started accepting guests. In fact, it's embarrassing to say, but you are among our first in a long while. Regardless, uh, you are welcome to stay for as long as you'd like. The dragon hums in thought, letting his claws brush through and tug at his beard. The words Jean spoke at their parting, which had spurred him on through the trek along the desert road outside, tease against the back of his mind once more. Again, he looks around the empty lobby, and then up to Asterion's face. Behind his servile facade, the half-man, half-bull looks eager. His hooves clop faintly against the tile as he shifts from one to the other, and an almost childish earnest flickers behind his polite smile, made no less friendly by the missing of half of Asterion's face. The hotel seems to be about as run down as its keeper, but there's potential there. Hope. Thank you very much, Mr. Asterion. I would be happy to stay for at least a little while. I have a very little money. But I would be glad to perform any tasks you would need that would allow me to earn a bed and a hot meal. That, wouldn't, that won't be necessary, sir. This is our soft opening, so we won't charge you. In fact, we charge very little regularly. So money is not an issue. As long as the hotel is able to fulfill its mission. Asterion moves to pick the ledger and a pen up off of the front desk, and brings it over to the dragon. Just sign here, and fill out a little bit of information. After a few moments of writing, the half-man, half-bull accepts the ledger back from Kota and looks over to the guest's new information. Kota has been checked into the hotel! You can see your current guests in the list of guests screen on the menu, or clicking the ledger icon. Oh, this is so cool! Oh, I know who this one is in the middle. Oh, we got a Asterion, we got Kota, and we got a bunch of others. I don't know who those others are, but I'm looking forward to them. Oh boy. A calm river spirit from Japan. The hotel's keeper, and prisoner of the labyrinth. Aw, old deed, ledger. This is so cool! Tech. Ah, oh, this is so awesome. Let me see the preferences to see if anything changed. Okay, guest is here. These two haven't changed. Cool! This is so awesome! Mr. Kota. No surname. Born February 2nd, 1615. I must say, you're looking very well for your age, sir. Kota blinks, <laughs> frowns, and is this close to slapping the other shit out, out of Master, or not Master, out of Keeper Asterion? Holds his hand out for the ledger. 
Excuse me, may I see that for a moment? He looks over his writing. Yenna 1, fifth day of the first month. Exactly the way he had written it. I did not realize that you could read Japanese, Mr. Asterion. Uh, Japanese, sir? And that's when it hits Kota. The, shapes of his to the shape of his tongue as he had spoken to the Minotaur all this time had seemed strange. And only now does he realize that, after his coughing fit, he'd switched to his native tongue without realizing it. And yet, Asterion has been able to understand him. In fact, the half-man, half-bull didn't even seem to realize that Kota was speaking another language. How? Ah, I see. I understand now. Don't be alarmed, sir. It is just a quirk of the hotel. It allows us to understand all the guests that pass through our doors, no matter what country they hail from or language they choose to speak. I myself am from the Mediterranean, far away from here, so we can rest assured that all our guests are welcome no matter where they come from. I should also add, I can see you are a dragon. Enhancements do not work here. But worry not, that is allowed here. All who are lost are welcome. A place for wanderers indeed. I see. The dragon stands and offers a stare on the deep bow of his own. If what both Jean and this half man, half bull said is true, then perhaps this is exactly where Kota needs to be. Thank you very much, Mr. Asterion. You honor me with your hospitality. Asterion moves to set the ledger back on the front desk and returns to Kota with a key. He passes it to the dragon while giving Kota another welcoming smile. Here is your key, Mr. Kota. If you would like... I can show you to your room. I hope that you have an enjoyable stay with us. Aww, what a sweet chapter. <gasps> now we're on chapter six, housewarming. Can I save here? I'm just gonna save here quickly. Where the heck's my save slot? There it is. Wow, I saved a lot of chapters. I am player Dirk. And my chapter is six. Well, we're going to take a break here at the one hour and three minute mark because I need to get a drink of water and just, you know, take a little break. I should probably hydrate a little more. I had some blood drawn earlier today, so. Just to figure out some health related things. Like I've talked about my sensitive gut, I think, before. So that's kind of what it was for, mostly. Anyway. Huh. <sighs> All right, so what am I missing? Hey, jerk. Okay, I asked that. Answer that question already. Best advice. Yeah, nothing too much I missed. Heyo to Tendo Mendo. Great to see you here. And yeah, <laughs> shaking my head. Love a good Eastern dragon. Hmm, indeed. Orlando would have a good friend now. Oh, that was from like a TV show. <laughs> I was like, wait, is there like a police or? Ambulance outside or something? No. There were some fire trucks going by us earlier when I was coming home from like grocery shopping with my mom. Uh, we were just getting like my prescription that I needed for something, and yeah, when we were coming home, we saw like a fire on like like smoke coming from like kind of a mountain area nearby us, and we're like, oh shoot, this is kind of close. Luckily, it supposedly got contained, and so it looked pretty big from when we had seen it, but once a couple of hours subsided, things seemed to get better. So yeah, that was a bit of a panic because it was closer to my dad's office. <laughs> so I was like, oh no, I have some of my stuff there. 
Yeah, so. Anyway, are you cool if I take a bathroom break? I'm gonna go do a bathroom break quickly. So, if I can do a stream loading here and say we will be right back. Oh no. Oh, I know what I did. I forgot to save that image. I made I made it so that the we'll be right back is part of this now. Just because I want this to just be an intermission screen. I feel like it's more suiting for that than preparing the stream. <laughs> I like this one though. It's a funny little gimmick that I have. Where the heck did it go? Drawings for videos better be here there we go all right so I'll be back in a bit I'll probably turn off the mic for now and enjoy the nice relaxing music see you in a second All right, that was pretty quick. I'm back. Um, <laughs> I'll probably turn off this we'll be right back screen like at the end of the video when I do like my reading off of my patrons and whatnot. I think I'll do it as like a beginning and end thing. Like when I actually read the patrons, I'll show the screen. So yeah, once again, I apologize for my terrible lighting at the moment. This is only a temporary setup situation once I have everything moved back permanently or when I'm at my studio I will have my main setup of things I need to make sure I remember to convince my parents and whatnot to keep the lamps and whatnot that I have up there so I can use that as proper lighting because I have like two lights up there like a lamp and a kind of adjustable reader thing I'm not sure how well that will <laughs> be because it's kind of thin but yeah I have a lamp the lamp will be nice. Maybe I'll put it there in the corner. How the heck not? What can go wrong? So, yeah, nothing new from the chat, but that's all cool. I know this is a very chill, relaxing stream. We could start in a bit if y'all want, but before we do, I had an idea for March Madness for next year. Just because somebody was talking about how it was kind of unfair, how some characters from like bigger novels like Adastra or like Far Beyond the World were facing characters from like smaller or maybe less known novels like, uh, <laughs> I can't speak, uh, <laughs> like, shoot, I'm thinking Password's kind of bigger though, like, would I say password? Smoke Room had some amazingly amazing snubs and upsets in the first round. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe this compared to like the Smoke Room or whatnot, Far Beyond the World and Adastro were like far greater in popularity. Like, so my idea was like, hey, I just typed this down, like, maybe for cat, we should have categories slash like divisions or whatnot for March Madness, like a popularity category, maybe like by like number of downloads or whatnot. So like maybe smaller novels or novels that haven't had as many downloads and whatnot do not get faced off against way too popular novels and get like blown out of the water. So like maybe like a medium size of 
big size division. I don't know. And then maybe even a newcomer's division. Why the heck not? Like, I just thought of that one right now. So. So novel released within the past 12 months. Should I do 12 months? Yeah, why the heck not? That would be our newcomers group. Honestly, with all of that, I may have to shrink those brackets into like smaller groups and whatever. It's a lot of stuff if I had to do all these different groups. But honestly, I feel like it would be a blast doing all of them. Like I love doing the bracket. Unfortunately, it takes a lot of time. But, you know, when I get to it, it's really a blast and I just enjoy it all so much. Anyway, I should get started. I wasted about eight minutes. Great. Let's get started right now. Chapter six. I don't think there was a name for it. Oh, no, wait, there was. House coming. Doi. And I'm gonna put dash, chapter five to whatever. Anyway, here we go. Chapter six, baby, let's go. Yes, this is Minotaur Hotel. <laughs> Thanks, Trinix Slayer. It has been an hour or so since Asterion left the lounge. The Minotaur had led you back to the hotel's hearth to check in on it. Everything seemed to be in working condition. You both did the rounds and inspected the hotel. The stairways. The lobby. Every lamp and switch and door you could find. Some of the walls were still cracked, windows were smashed, and there was water damage here and there. The sight displeased Asterion, but the hotel seemed to be repairing itself at an impressive rate. You both stopped at the lounge to take a break and celebrate a job well done. Asterion served you your favorite drink again, and, with your permission, took a glass of wine himself. After a brief chat, you checked the time only to notice your phone's battery was long dead. But the hotel has power now. You wished for a socket to plug your phone in, and after a blink it materialized before you. Okay, was it a good idea to stick your phone's charger in there though? Would the hotel get the correct voltage and frequency? Uh, it may have been reckless, but you tried anyway. If only to state your curiosity. And this is the other novel where we just electrocute ourselves. Asterion was eager to resume the inspection. You were enjoying the break, so you let him continue without you. <gasps> oh, sorry. That was about our chat during the break, like Minotaur Hotel being like a smaller novel. Yeah, that would be a good example. And if it came out within like the past year, it'd be a newcomer, in my opinion. Once again, figuring out the whole categories and stuff. Anyway, <laughs> the time alone proved beneficial. So much happened in the last few days. Meeting the old man, finding the hotel and the Minotaur inside, the altercation with Argos. After a drink and some time, you didn't feel as overwhelmed. All the craziness seemed to be under control. You check in on your phone after spending a couple hours in the armchair by the hearth. It had barely changed 3% of your battery. It probably won't remain on for more than a minute. As you head back to the couch to sit down, you hear a sound that has grown familiar to you over these few days. Asterion's hooves clopping towards you. Good afternoon, master. Uh, hello, Asterion. Are you done with your inspection? Well, I had to cut it short. I don't want to disturb you, but I have very good news. Asterion walks up to you at a brisk and excited pace, and hands you to the ledger. He stands there, waiting for you to open it. He shifts his weight from hoof to hoof. Oh, it's so cute! And his tail swishes back and forth in unison with his flicking ears. Kota? Just... Kota? Huh? 
Wait a second. 1615? I was born many centuries ago as well, Master. <laughs> Don't make fun of old people. Generally, our guests are, are human, but not all of them. I'm still getting used to it, Asterion. <laughs> well, I have to see this for myself now. You look like a kid on Christmas Eve, you know. Please excuse me, Master. <laughs> I just, uh, haven't had guests in so long. Well, I can't wait to meet this guy. <laughs> I'm intrigued. You think he's in his room now? I suppose so, yes. I'd rather not disturb the guests. But this is a special occasion, isn't it? Perhaps this one time. You are about to head to the new guest's room when you hear footsteps approaching the lounge. A new traveler approaches. The footsteps are slow and even, carefully measured as though the one approaching is taking his sweet time to take in his surroundings. They're accompanied by a faint sound, keeping time with each step. A quiet, simple tune, hummed in a deep, rumbling voice. The melody is like the flowing of a stream, steady and constant. There he is! When your first guest arrives at the lounge, his eyes are already wandering up and down to catch the grandeur and lingering decay of the place. He seems to be lost in thought as he examines the leather couches, the hearth, the tables and chairs. It's only when Asterion clears his throat with a polite cough that the dragon seems to realize that you're there. I trust the accommodations are to your liking, Mr. Kota. Ah, oh, Mr. Asterion, they are indeed, thank you. Uh, forgive me, I, I was just looking around. It's alright, er, no wait, it's alright. Go on and make yourself at home. The dragon, Mr. Kota, over to you and, er, over to you, I completely missed a word there. The dragon, Mr. Kota, looks over to you as you speak up. He offers you a low bow and a polite smile. Thank you very much for the hospitality. I take it that you're the master that Mr. Stelion mentioned at check-in. Uh, yes. I'm the owner. I'm Dirk. The Red Panda. The dragon's smile widens. He gives you another shallower bow. But why did I say bow like that? He gives you another shallower bow while shaking your hand with a firm grip. It is an honor, Master Dirk. I'm being called Master. I mean, uh, yeah. Asterion clears his throat again, gaining the dragon's attention once more. Is there anything I can get for you at this time, Mr. Kota? A meal? Or a drink, perhaps? Oh, no, no. Thank you very much. <laughs> but as I said, I'm just looking around right now. Perhaps later. Very well. Then, if I may be so bored as to ask, what do you think of that... What do you think of our fine hotel so far? It's, uh, nice. A little run down, more run down than I pictured. And I would have thought there would have already been guests. But I suppose that's what I get for getting my hopes up. Ah, I, I see. The Minotaur tries to keep his face neutral, but you can tell that Kota's words have cut deep. The hotel is Asterion's pride and joy, and to have it criticized by the first guest in years like that must be hurt. At least he's not calling it drama and doing a whole YouTube tirade on it, like some people do, like some YouTubers. Anyway. 
If you don't like it, you can leave. <laughs> oh god, that would be awful. It's a work in progress. Like my visual novel, which god damn it I forgot to write about today. Ugh. I got one quarter of the game scenes done, and I need to finish the other three fourths. Probably the second quarter is going to be what takes me the longest, and the other two quarters are probably going to be shorter because one character is going to be shorter than the others. Yeah, looking forward to that. I just, ugh, medical stuff and health, ugh, it's crazy. Anyway, feeling better, luckily. Just like my health, it's a work in progress. Well, hey, it's a work in progress. Oh, you should have seen how it looked when I first got here. Um, I should have Smarties with me, but God damn it, I forgot my Smarties. So instead, I'll stay hydrated. Uh, what I mean is, we're working on it. And once we get the place completely cleaned up, I think you'll be amazed. Despite how things look now, I can tell that this was once a grand place. I can see the beauty of it even under the, all the dust and decay. <laughs> Although, if it's just the two of you, then I imagine it will take quite a while to restore its former glory. Are there no other staff here? Oh, oh it, it may surprise you, but Asteria and I can get a lot done. Still, yes, we are looking for people willing to join our staff. Come join our cult of a hotel. It's got self-repairing self buildings, unlimited wine, and the desert. I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> if you don't like it, then it's a whip. No, I'm not going to whip. God damn it, I whipped. <sighs> Asterion. Can you tell me, Mr. Kota, or can you tell me, <laughs> Serion, can you tell Mr. Kota how things worked here back then? Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> Before issues arose with the previous manager, it was quite common for guests to choose to remain here indefinitely. Most didn't have anywhere else to go, you see. And we can pay reasonably well. Or we should soon enough. Seeing as the hotel does not aim to generate profits. And the guests who join our staff get to enjoy all the hotel's facilities for as long as they want, free of charge. Indeed. Hmm. The dragon begins brushing his claws through, through his long beard, looking from you to Asterion, and back again. Finally, a spark of resolve shines in his eyes. Mr. Stellion, back when I checked in, I offered my services in exchange for being allowed to stay. If you two are in need of staff, then I would be happy to help in any way that can repay the hospitality you two have shown to me. I've worked many odd jobs over the years of traveling, and I've gained a variety of skills. Cooking, cleaning, a few years of doing manual labor. I may not look it. The dragon pats the round, firm rise of his belly with a laugh. Oh, Coda. But my body is solid. I even spent a few months as a bartender back. Hmm, 20 years ago? 30? Speaking honestly, I enjoyed the job the most. I enjoyed that job the most. The conversations with others. Tales swapped and secrets divulged to be kept in confidence or in confidence. Finding the light drink for your customer. The one that would soothe their lilies and keep their... or help their ki... The one that would soothe their lilies and help to ease their burdens. At least for the little time they spent at the counter. The dragon's expression grows pensive, and his gaze distant. When you gaze, or when you glance over to Asterion, you see a similar look in the Minotaur's eyes, and he lets out a thoughtful hum. 
The moment is broken as Kota shakes himself out of his reverie. He gives you a rueful smile. Forgive me. I get lost in reminiscence sometimes. My point is that I can do anything you need of me. I'm happy to help. You can feel the Sterian's eyes on you. When you glance to the bull, you see him silently begging your permission to speak. If you have something to say, then go ahead, Asterion. Very well, Master Dirk. The lounge could be the ser the lounge could use the services of a good bartender. <laughs> Though I can perform the role well enough, I do have other duties as keeper which come first. Management of the lounge has often been delegated to a suitable guest in the past. I think it would be in good hands with you behind the counter, Mr. Kota. Well then, that works out perfectly. In the contrary of my birth, it was often said that fortune follows in the wake of dragons. <laughs> Though I cannot benefit from it myself, I'm happy to offer it to my gracious hosts. <laughs> oh, believe me, <laughs> we can use all the good luck we can get. But before we get ahead of ourselves, I want to ask you something, Mr. Kota. You said earlier that you got your hopes up before coming here. What were you hoping to find? I see nothing gets past you, Master Dirk. <laughs> you say nothing and allow the dragon to gather his thoughts. For years, centuries now, I've been looking for something. Someone dear to me, who was lost a long time ago. I've traveled the entire world searching for him, but so far, I haven't had any luck. No matter where I've gone, or how many people I've asked. When I've heard about this hotel opening, I thought, perhaps there would be someone here who could offer a lead in my search. This hotel is a place for wanderers to gather, is it not? The dragon bows and his expression grows blank. However, you can see desperation flash in his eyes for just a moment. The desperation of a man who's come so close to his goal, only to have the rug pulled out from under him time and time again. If you allow me to stay here, to speak with the other guests and hear their tales of wandering, perhaps I will find the lead that I've been searching for. And do you plan to leave once you've found it? Again, the dragon's eyes flash. Oh. Will I be allowed to? Of course, this hotel was not meant to be a prison. Er, this hotel was not meant to be a prison. For the guests, at least. <laughs> you will be free to leave once you've found out what you are looking for, Mr. Kota. Or whenever you wish, naturally. I don't plan to disappear in the middle of the night if that worries you. <laughs> I'll be sure to make arrangements so that my departure doesn't inconvenience you. <laughs> oh, I don't know how long it will be, but before I find what I'm looking for, anyway. <laughs> Until the time comes, yeah, I may as well do my part as your guest, right? Again. You take a look at Asterion. It looks like the Minotaur has already made his mind up for talking to Coda as staff. Or for taking on Coda as staff. The hotel's mission is to take in those who are lost. Going by what you've told us tonight, it would seem you fit the bill. Oh, wait, yeah. Going on by what you've told us tonight, it would seem you fit the bill. Are you willing and ready to uphold the hotel's mission, and bow to the owner's authority? How formal! <laughs> How formal! <laughs> I haven't heard a contract of service put in quite a way that in centuries. Oh, it makes me feel nostalgic. <laughs> as long as I'm free to pursue my own agenda, 
then yes. For the duration of my stay in the hotel, I will happily serve in any way that I can. Well, Sir Dirk, with your command, I can have it all arranged. What say you? Seeing as Mr. Cota swore our oath already, all you need to do is, Mr. Cota, hereby you are taken into this hotel as staff to fulfill its mission and to serve as manager of the lounge. Shoot, I forgot it already! Uh, uh, fancy, huh? Very well. Coda, hereby you are taken as staff to this hotel to fulfill its mission and work as manager of the lounge. Fuck, I already messed it up! You offer your handshake. Aww. Kota takes her hand in both of his and, once again, gives you a low bow. His smile is placid, but his eyes are shining with an earnest light you hadn't noticed when you first met the dragon. Oh, that was supposed to be a fading scene. There we go. The lights in the hotel shift for a second right after you both let go of each other's hand. Ooh, what was that? <laughs> oh, worry not, Mr. Kota. It is just another quirk of the hotel. As you have been taken on as another staff member in charge of the lounge, you are hereby given free authority to shape it as you please. I have fond memories of this lounge's current layout, but the labyrinth has always shifted its appearance throughout the years. Maybe it's time to give it an update. Well, it could look more modern. In truth, I appreciate the way it looks. It's a thing of beauty, even as it is now. He runs his clawed hand over the bar top. Again, the softly hummed tune rumbles in his throat. Old or new, something that appeals to a traditional sensibility, and yet is welcoming to all types. Mr. Kota? Ah, forgive me. I was lost in reminiscence again. <laughs> I was uh, thinking about the bar I used to work in. <laughs> oh, would it be stepping beyond my bounds to give the lounge a personal touch? Please feel free. Uh, mm, please feel free. In that case, uh, that was Scottish. In that case, I think I have a few ideas that you may like. <laughs> one by one, the lights flicker as you approve of Kota's requests. He looks to you to gauge your reaction to each change, as well as Asterion's. Let's add a little more light, yes? <laughs> and everything just goes black. Damn it, I can't see anything! Oh, but keep it, keep the dark wood. In fact, do you mind if we make it a little darker? Hmm, some more seating would be nice. Here, here, and here. Oh, and the sailing around the hearth would be perfect. Please, Mr. Kota, my only request is that you don't alter that area too much. Alright, how about over here then? Kota continues to add his own personal touches to the lounge. Lamps in the shape of paper lanterns hanging over the bar counter traditional Javanese artwork on the walls, Intri intricately folded napkins at every table. Fancy. Ooh, this looks very nice. I love it. By the time you are done, the old lounge has turned into a brightly lit restaurant that strikes a delicate balance between traditional and modern. Kota continues to examine every detail it seems like he wouldn't be satisfied until everything is perfect. Asterion looks around, a thoughtful expression on the Minotaur's own face. It looks... Amazing. Good work, Mr. Coda. Oh, please. <laughs> I, I am supposed. I suppose if I am to be staying here for a while, then just Kota will be all right. Well, in that case, just Dirk and Asterion will be all right for us. 
deal. <laughs> well now, I think this place is looking bet better already. Warm, welcoming. If you don't mind me saying, it already feels like some place I could call a home. <laughs> At least, for the time being. <laughs> uh, home. That sounds good to me. How about we have a drink to celebrate? We can tell you more about how things work around here, and how they will work once we start getting more guests. Oh, I'm loving this so much. Ah! Kota goes over to the counter, grabs a beer mug, and returns to you. Alright, I'll whip something up, shall I? I look forward to working on this with the both of you. Estelion, Dirk. Cheers! Oh, this is. Wait, is he dipping his hands? He, oh, he's wiping it. I thought I thought it was full of beer, and he was just putting his fingers in there. Like, here, let me just fill up a pitcher of beer. Okay, moving on. Cheers! And we move on to chapter 7. 1 hour, 36 minutes, and 30 seconds. 30 seconds? 1, 36, 30. Chapter, <laughs> chapter 7. I'm not sure if this will be the final chapter I do for tonight. Let me see how many chapters are in this update in general to see if I'm at a point where I should just grind it through or maybe split it up into another part. Because I feel like we're probably like this and maybe one more episode away from getting completed with everything Minotaur Hotel has to offer in this first go around. Oh god, so much back at Rempy! Ah! Chapter 6. Let's see if. Okay, chapter seven. Yeah, it doesn't seem too long. It... Hmm, it's still part of update two, supposedly. So I just want to check to see like what the other chapters are. Uh, it seems like ch there's no chapter 8? Am I wrong? Maybe chapter 8 is part of update 2? Maybe the end of update? I don't know. Uh, sorry, I just want to see how many chapters there are total because, yeah, this is a long the end. It's a good thing, but I just want to... Yeah, there's like a couple of, yeah, 13 and like two more, I think. So it's like about 15 chapters in total. Sorry, I just wanted to get sure about that. I'll change the time marker to one hour 39. I don't want to like, you know, in case anybody's just watching the reading parts, I don't want them to be delayed by this. All right, less than 10 seconds, we continue on. And well, welcome to everybody who came, Zinx, Furry Zinx, Shining Chaos, and we continue on. Just do what you gotta do, Entertainer. Oh, thank you. You spend the rest of the day with Asterion and Kota in the lounge, admiring the change of decor, sharing drinks, and exchanging stories. Kota had some interesting stories to tell about his life on the road. You recounted some of yours in turn. Companies you worked for. That time you tried freelancing. Of course you and Coda had to take a break to explain computers to Asterion. Asterion kept quiet for most of the conversation about past experiences. His brief answers made clear his apprehension about sharing a story with Coda. Still, the Minotaur had his shy smile throughout the whole night. 
As soon as the topic turned back to anything less personal, he'd rejoin the conversation. With the aid of a few glasses of wine, with the good pressure of alcohol, I should have. I was thinking about getting some, like, like having like a hard lemonade or something like that to drink with this during the stream, but I was like, eh, I'll probably save it for when I do like wolf stars in the paradise or something. <laughs> but maybe I could be drinking with them. I should drink with the boys. Ah, anyway, let's just continue on. With the aid of a few glasses of wine. Asterion's posture relaxed, slouched on his chair, eyes half closed, he was afloat in the sea of bliss. Eventually, it started to get late, and you bid Kota farewell. You and Asterion, meanwhile, returned to the master's quarters. Asterion stumbles about with you, drowsy but happy. He hums and sways his head back and forth, his hooves at a rhythm which echoes through the hallways. When he looks back to you, his one eye has a faint glimmer. Long day, huh? Yes, indeed. <laughs> it's been so long. Time demanded its due. Oh, so much has changed. Peculiar faces, a different lounge, a whole new time. But, I feel like I used to back, th uh, I feel like I used to back then, surrounded by friends, talking well into the night. I, I have purpose again. I cannot thank you enough. Uh, it's nothing. No, it is, it is quite something. It is a high honor to serve you, master. While we're at it, there's something about which I should inform you. It is, it is your right as master to know, and my duty as keeper to inform you. Remember that story I told you in the lounge? Which one? You told so many. The one about Master Robert and his son Master Bernard, whom I helped raise. Ah, now, where should I start? I asked you today if you liked how I looked when I tried on my clothes. And that was not a trivial question. The master has a right to determine how the keeper should look. That, of course, includes how I should present myself. What my uniform should be. But it goes deeper than that. During master's... During Master Bernard's mandate, he deemed I should have white fur. Before arriving here, he was a physician, you see, and believed it would convey cleanliness. Meanwhile, Master Robert always wanted me to have black fur, even as a child. He thought I looked respectable and imposing like that, and that he too would seem powerful when riding on my back. I suspect with time, Master Robert insisted I had black fur solely to annoy his father. The two of whom bickered about it quite often. They'd even exchanged jabs about it during dinner. But when the father was on his deathbed, he requested a moment to talk in private with each and every one of his descendants. Not so private in reality. I stayed by the bedside to annotate his will, to make sure each and every one would have their corresponding legacy. Midway through, he asked me to see how he... Midway though, midway through, he asked to see me how he remembered me. His son acquiesced, and so I served him until the end. To my unfaltering servant, it's what he wrote in that letter. And Sir Robert, to my childhood playmate. This too is the master's right. You may choose how I should look. The labyrinth's magic will arrange it. By the oath I have sworn, I am obligated to inform. I am bound to instruct you 
to the best of my abilities on all of the hotel's requests and capabilities. So you see, my asking master what he thought of my clothes, that was not trivial. Your will is in order. I'm curious, why is the master allowed to do this? The why? I have burdened you terribly, my lord, with their my rabbling. I would prefer you not to weigh, weigh you down further with unsightly knowledge. But to answer your question in a delicate way, as you, see, as you can see, I can be healed quickly. The special wine I drink is used to hasten the process. I am terribly difficult to endure permanently. The labyrinth allows me to master, but to control my form to an extent. With the goal of making it so I would not heal from certain injuries, should the master wish it so. Oh, let's remain quiet. I suppose master sees where I'm going with this. What is your will, my lord? Ooh. Which choice do you want to steer in? Aww. Honestly, that'd be cool just to see him randomly choose. I mean, I like his brown fur a lot. Man, I'm curious. Ah, I should save at this point just in case. He looks good. <laughs> Let's see what the black fur looks like. Black. Yes, my lord. I have been told my black fur goes well with my formal attire. There was one master who insisted that I help out in the lounge as such. A few guests even said I made for a striking spectacle. Asterion closes his eyes and focuses. Before your eyes, his fur begins to change. Ooh! <laughs> Why did I say that? Why did I say it like that? Oh, how dashing! You're quite dashing. He is now illustrious black, as per your request. Now let's see what happens if it looks some other color. Ah, frick. Yeah, get there. Let's see what white fur looks like. White. Very well. Now this is nostalgic. Oh, pardon me. I was thinking out loud. It's nothing the master should worry about. Staring closes his eyes and focuses. For your eyes, he begins to change. Thank you, phone, for reminding me. All right. Oh, look at this! Asterion's fur is now a lustrous white color, as per your request. Looking very nifty. <sighs> I'm honored with your choice, Master. The only issue I have is that around the eye, it looks a bit odd around there then. Like it kind of stands out a little more. Around the brown, it doesn't look too bad. Let me see what black was again. Uh, I mean, still, it's like a little, but it's not too bad. I don't know, the white is the most striking to me, but oof, I'll go with white or black. What do you all think? We should all vote! He looks good in every color. I wonder what the random one does. What color? Which color would you rather be? Excuse me? You heard me. Which color would you rather be? <laughs> Rainbow fur, oh my goodness. What would you prefer? I, master, need not worry about what I want. I'm the servant and my will shouldn't affect your judgment. But I want to learn more about you. I appreciate knowing, even if you don't think it matters. The Minotaur sighs and bites his lip. You think you displeased him somehow, but then a smile grows. Shy as a blossoming flower. It means a lot to me that you asked. It's very kind of you. It is just... Uh, pardon me. I'm not used to being asked what I want. The Minotaur turns around and picks up a bottle of wine you had brought from the lounge. With a trained dexterity, he opens it with a corkscrew. Staring turns back to you, then looks down at the wine glass on the table. 
He holds the bottle with both his hands, like the one would hold a cross over one's chest. He steps towards the glass, but pauses and puts his bottle onto his lips. You can see his Adam's apple bobbing as he drowns his sorrows. When he meets your gaze again, there's a softness in his eyes you hadn't seen before. If Master wishes my honesty, I would be soothed if I knew Master appreciates me. My first color is secondary at best compared to that. I suppose I struggle with putting this into words. The masters have commanded me to change to fit their visions. The same goes for how I should act and address them. And I obeyed eagerly. Uh, because I thought it would make, me, make them like me more. And if they appreciate me, won't they, won't they be less likely to send me out to the valley? I will legally don whatever color you wish, if it will make Master like me more. Perhaps even prize me. It's not often I've been asked what I want. I am a prisoner, after all. Why should the jailer care for my comfort? That would extend me such consideration. That is reason enough for me to rejoice. In which case, it is the right I give you an answer. One clearer than what I've told you so far. When I was alive, my fur was white. In my dreams, I still might see myself with that same white fur. In the waking world, I look down and sometimes can't withhold a certain surprise to find out which it isn't the case. After all those years locked away, I hadn't even forgotten what my fur color currently was. If Master wants an answer, that is it. White fur would be nostalgic for me, so I'd be happy no matter what, as long as you... As long as you don't hurt me. That's... Aww. That's right, Shining Chaos. Aww, it's so sweet. We're not gonna hurt you. Please don't feel pressured to consider this into your decision. I'm already happy you cared enough to ask. Whatever your choice is, I will be careful. I won't hurt you. I won't hurt you. I understand why you're afraid. I could see myself being suspicious of any new masters after what happened to you. My words might not convince you right now, but I'll say them nonetheless. I won't hurt you. The Minotaur holds on tightly to his bottle of wine. He looks down and bites his lip. A sudden weight seems to bear down on his back. I am only half full. <laughs> I'm acquainted with the wiles of the human heart. <laughs> Perhaps Master take pity on me tonight. But I know how fragile human whims are. How they fade so quickly. I... I thought long and hard over these decades locked away. About this hotel. My sentence. My previous masters. And a young boy I knew. He was around my age. So centuries old. His name was Icarus. That fucker flew right into the sun, that damn bastard. His father fashioned wings out of beeswax and feather for the both of them. But Icarus had the hubris of flying too close to the sun. That damn man. The damn man actually did it. The mad lad actually did it. He fell to his death in the sea below. And we met in Hades, after my death. I thought about him, oh, that boy. Had I committed the same mistake by allowing myself to be happy? Joy was never my lot in life. Asterion caresses the table like he would a lover. His nails graze against the wood, clicking just loud enough for you to hear. Much like Icarus, I enjoyed the glimpse of freedom. His hotel was my set of wings. A chilly breeze blows from in from the window. It sends a shiver down your spine, and a sudden stone coldness to Asterion's face. Oh wait, 
I read that part. A chilly breeze blows from in from the window. It sends a shiver down your spine and a sudden stone coldness to Asterion's face. There are promises which cannot be fulfilled, my lord. The hotel knows this well. Not all contracts can be made to have an effect. The labyrinth would not allow one that opposes its stated mission. There was one master who, early in his mandate, tried passing a contract which would forbid any and all from harming me. It could not be made to have an effect. The ink would drip off from it, the paper aged and rotted like milk. Worse still, his charity ran out one day. It is easy to offer one gesture of mercy, but to have it last requires a special kind of intensity. Power reveals what lays underneath. There were a number of gentle masters who turned sour and grew comfortable with harsh punishments. Even the kindest ones have not shied away from punishing me. It was their mission, after all. Sorry. You and Asterion both stare at each other. He eventually looks away, scratching the left side of his face. I... I... Oh, please, forgive what I said, my lord. You approach Asterion. You raise your hand and cradle the left side of his face. You run your fingers over his short fur while taking care not to get too close to his injury. Asterion hesitates, but with each caress of your fingers, his eyes close further and he leans his weight against your hand. I promised I wouldn't send you to the valley. And I won't. And I won't hurt you. Asterion fully supports his weight on your hand. His eyelid flutters, as if he was already falling asleep. You lift your other hand, and begin petting the right, healthier side of Asterion's face. The Minotaur leans towards you, and you scoot closer to balance his weight. You let the Minotaur have his nap, until his ear flicks. You- Good night! <laughs> My dad's wishing me good night. I can't say Pog in chat for having my dad wish me goodnight, but not F in chat, but something in chat, I guess. Happy faces in chat for my dad wishing me a good night. <laughs> All right, so you let the Minotaur have his nap until his ear flicks. You give it a gentle rub and his eyes shoot open, Squidward meme style. Oh, I Master Dirk. I'm sorry. I don't know what got into me. It must be the drowsiness. It won't happen again. He remains with his head in your hands. It's fine. How are you feeling now? I'm well. Good. Asterion hesitates further before prying himself away from you, but with a sigh, he does so. <sighs> Again, I am so sorry. You did nothing wrong. There's no reason for you to say that. As you say, my lord. It's alright, Asterion. It will be different. Don't you worry. Pick a fur color for Asterion. Oh shoot, we're back at it again with the same old save. Let's just overwrite this one because it's pretty much, you know, a good thing. I didn't see what brown fur did. I, I want to see what that one was because 
white was nostalgic for him, black was like what the child liked and made him striking, which I liked a lot. Brown for let's see. Is that so? This is the color Master G. Marie picked. Oh, that's nice. Nostalgia there. He found it the most unassuming and admitted to me that he always envisioned the Minotaur as brown furred. I can see that! He does look pretty good with the brown fur in general. That has been quite a common occurrence for over the centuries. Each lord has had his own vision of what I was supposed to look like. Oh, pardon me. I do not mean to lay doubt on your judgement, master. Your will is obeyed without question. I'm honored with your choice, master. Okay, so that's it for that choice. Let's put it up to a poll, baby! What color fur do we want to make a Starion? As I read this text message for my work. Okay, okay. Everything's all hunky-dory. Alright, yeah, they're just like talking about like work times or whatnot because I had to have a shift moved because by accident I shifted, I put a shift when I was like work playing a match and I was like, shoot, I'm supposed to be working the match I'm playing. <laughs> and so I was like, can I please get a switch here? And they're like, fine. They moved me like to two hours before. So I was like, whew, just in time. Everything's all good now. So please vote if you want. One vote for white, two votes for white. It means a lot to him. Oh, I like that he's keeping his intent and heart. White for me, three votes for white. Oof. Black. I okay. Now I feel like a dick if I just choose the one that I want. I feel like let me just check what Lied did, because I think Lied did it as like, I think he did white. I'm just gonna double check his channel to see what color he made uh, Asterion. Just, you know, maybe to be unique so I don't copy him. Uh, his channel is basically what I could, what I only dream of being. Twice as many subs. <laughs> ah, yeah. but, but I'm happy for him. He does a great job and his is more of a clean read through, I'd say. Like, you know, no commentary in between. Oh, there's my VN with 6k views. God damn, I can't believe that many people actually cared about my VN. Uh, where the heck is it? Asterion, where are you? Did he do it all in one run? He ha can't be. Come on. Where the heck is your Minotaur Hotel reading line? It'd be funny if he's watching this right now and he's just like, hey. Ah, uh, you don't have Minotaur Hotel. Oh, there it is. I lied. Okay, I'm gonna pause that. There's no ads. No ads. Wow. Maybe that's an older video if it's the first one. Yeah, he made him white. So, if y'all are cool, I'm gonna probably choose between black and brown then. Your screen thoughts take a while to pop up, so it's just just so it's said. Yeah, I've I've seen that happen with other streamers beforehand, from first-hand experience or second-hand experience. So yeah, good note for people watching Shining Chaos. My reactions, what I'm reacting now, you guys are seeing it like a few seconds later. Oh, you're doing an amazing job. Well, thank you. Literally anything but white. God damn it, Nua. <laughs> Are y'all okay if I go with black? Just for shits and giggles. I'm sorry that I put it up to a poll and then was like, Nope, I'm doing my color. <laughs> this is a democracy, damn it. Except when I choose. <laughs> Black then. <laughs> I didn't mean to make you say it. I'm just saying that's what I'm choosing. 
If y'all want to play it and choose your color, just get up to chapter 7. The link for the game's in the description. <laughs> I'm sorry if I sound so bossy. Ah! Anyway. Let's go with black fur. I'm looking forward to this. Black. Yes, my lord. I have been told my black fur goes well with my formal attire. There was one master who insisted that I help out in the lounge as such. A few guests even said I made for a striking spectacle. Stereo closes his eyes and focuses. Before your eyes, his fur begins to change. Ooh, look at him! Asterion's fur is now a lustrous black color, as per your request. What was it before? Did... Okay, I just thought his eye color changed too. Nope. Oh, I'm loving it! I'm honored with your choice, Master. Yeah, he is hot in every color, like a lie. <laughs> but yes, Asterion heads to the kitchen to prepare you dinner. From time to time, you see him staring at his arms while he's cooking. Maybe he's getting used to his new fur color. After a while, Asterion returns to the table, serves you dinner, and sits on the opposite end of the table as well. Yeah, I can always change it later. Whenever the dress up shows up. Oh, you can? Really? Thanks, Trinix Slayer, for the advice. I'll note that. But I'll probably be stubborn and only do black. Because I like it. Eh, who knows? Anyway, when you look up, you are greeted by Asterion's big, dopey smile. Get your minds out of the gutter. He tries to contain himself, but it ends up with him having to stop his giggling. At times, he almost dozes it off, still with a smile plastered on his face. You finish your meal. Asterion goes to pick up your dish, as usual. This time, you left a big chunk for him to have, and he smiles as he heads to the kitchen. You bid each other good night, and then head to your respective bedrooms for the night. We did it! Oh, I thought that was the end of the chapter. The following morning, <laughs> as usual, the sound of Asterion's hooves clopping on the floor and the smell of breakfast wakes you up. God, you're making me want breakfast. I want food, and I know I can't eat after midnight, I think, because I am doing some sort of like screening where I can't eat for at least six to eight hours beforehand. Yeah, something like that. But anyway, you wake up, get dressed, and head out of the bedroom. Asterion once again greets you. Good morning, master. Hope you slept well. After the breakfast routine, this time Asterion served scrambled eggs, ham, and freshly squeezed orange juice. Mmm, that smells so good! He washes the dishes and returns to you. What are your- or wait, what are your plans for today, master? Well, it's still pretty early. I think I'm going to stick around here and tinker with my phone a little. So I see if I can get it to work. What about you? I think... I'll head down to reception. See if we're lucky enough to get any more guests. So soon? Well, I guess Coda got here soon after we lit the hearth. So it's possible. Oh, before I go. What should I wear today, Master? Is my fur color right? Let me see what it looks like with... Oh, you could change the color like that. See? Even in Chapter 7, you could do that. Oh, that's so cool. Clothes. <laughs> go around nude. <laughs> Let's go around nude, Hysterion, shall we? I'm curious now. Like, what? I wonder what the white underbelly looks like. Oh. Okay, not bad. Brown, white, black. Okay, it's pretty similar. Go around nude, sir. Please. Let's see what the modern shirt looks like. I mean, the, it looks bet looks better on him when he has brown for some reason. I wonder what it looks like with white. Not bad, actually. He looks pretty good with the white. 
<laughs> this feels like playing dress up. I love it. Why does this game have such good color? Why, why does this game have good stuff? <laughs> He's gonna go commando though. He's gonna wear modern clothes, but go commando. <laughs> nah, kid. Uh, I like, I think for, it's gonna be modern. I, I, I feel like, you know, it'll be nice to have a modern attire this time around. I think meeting Koda with a old school look was nice, but hopefully wearing modern clothes doesn't matter. At least you left him wearing the loin wrap. I wasn't that strong. Oh, you should have seen me earlier. Final state. Yeah, he's hot in every color, like we said before. I think I read that one already. I think you'll like it. I like the black. I like the black with the formal, but the white with this color for this modern outfit. <sighs> Let's finish. Confirm selection. That's my Styrian. <laughs> Lol. Alright, I'm just gonna save here for now. Here for now. Oh, that's the load button. My bad. Save here for now. Of course, I have to take a sip of the ellipses. What's the matter, Asterion? Well, uh, I'm debating whether I should tell you this or not, but... I suppose it mustn't mean a lot to you, but... I appreciate that Master has been good to me in one sense. What do you mean? Some of the... Uh, more ruthless Masters enjoyed humiliating me. In so many ways. Stripping me down and making me walk on all fours. That was a common one. I may be a hybrid, but I am half human. I'm not a beast. That came to an end, thankfully. In accordance with the contracts written and signed by previous masters, I'm forbidden from exposing myself when they are expecting guests. I mean, good. <laughs> Neither may I establish a relationship with a guest. Neither may I establish a relationship with a guest. I am under a variety of restrictions. Not all those contracts are written out of kindness, but they were beneficial. I'm happy that you haven't attempted to break that rule, Master Dirk. Forgive me for bringing up the subject, but I thought it was important that you know. Very well, then. Very well, then. I shall head to reception. Asterion leaves and gives you a smile before closing the door behind him. You sit down on the couch, staring at the door and then the window, and you think of how to spend your morning. Oh! Another chapter in between. Oh, I'm assuming... Nope. Maybe there's a chapter 8 after this? Oh, this guy. Luke. Oh boy. This is gonna be quite fun. Oh, hold on. I'm getting a note. Oh, good night. Okay, got it. Thanks. Yeah. My mom left me a note. Happy faces in chat for my mom leaving me a note. <sighs> anyway. It's America guy! It's the America guy! The griffin sits on a damp picnic table, sipping his stale, diluted, all-American beer. America! Oh, I should get Budweiser for this. Hold on, I gotta, I gotta be in character with this. 
I am getting the damn Budweiser. It tastes not that good, but I am getting it, god dang it. Excuse Dirk while he gets his Budweiser, please. back and I got a lot of stuff with me sorry it took so long and by a lot I just mean three things it was a lot to hold in my hands of course I had to refill some water but I also got back oh no drop frames I got myself some Budweiser. You, it's hard to see. The most American beer out there. Go crack a hard, go crack a cold one with the boys. By that I mean Luke. <laughs> oh God, Luke, best boy. People are crazy. Anyway, we'll start at 2:20. I also got myself popcorn on the side, but you know, I'm not. You know, 
try not to have it too much. Maybe I'll have it during the ellipses. Three pieces every ellipses. Okay, we're starting. The griffin sits in a damp picnic table, sipping his stale, diluted, all-American beer. <sighs> he hunches forward, supporting his elbows on his knees, and inhales the pitricker wafting from the rain-slick soil. He enjoys every gulp of his lukewarm. Oh, it's not even Bud Light! This is actual Budweiser! Are you freaking kidding me? Luke, your game is weak! Get actual Bud Lizer like a real man! He enjoys every gulp of his lukewarm Bud Light. Dude, it, it, that just brings back so many goddamn memories of parties. Letting it sit at his beak until all the taste is gone before swallowing. He looks ahead towards Cape Canaveral's launch site to avoid staring at the families nearby. He tells himself to smile. The table is coated in a fine layer of salty water, blown onto the mainland from the sea up ahead. That same salty condensation coats the griffin's feathers, fur, and beak. His mind hops with each languid blink of his eyes. The lukewarm beer with an aluminum aftertaste. <laughs> More than that, it's just piss. At least I'm the real man here drinking actual Budweiser. Bud Light. God. We still have like 15 or whatever outside in our fridge. I'm the only one drinking them. Petrichor smelled mixed in with grass from the grain, the humming of insects, the catchy pop song blaring from a stereo a few yards away. He taps his feet to the song's rhythm while laying a hand over the front pocket where he keeps his passport. The setting sun glaring at him, he raises a hand to shield his eyes. America! and looks at the fine, fine men hanging around with their families, dancing to the song. He knows they, he shouldn't, they are married after all, but the griffin can't stop himself from fantasizing. Griffin, stop ogling the girls! They are stout and hairy. <laughs> As I say that, the women are stout. Eh, any type for different strokes for different folks. They are stout and hairy, and damp from a humid day under the Florida sun. Oh, it's Florida. Oh no! Forgot Cape Canaveral. Yeah. Their shirts have sweat stains. A few of them are wearing tank tops like real men that ride up their bellies, showing off their treasure trails and navels. Hold on. I gotta. <laughs> I gotta reenact it for the game. One of them in particular, a man in his mid-thirties wearing khaki knee-high shorts and an unbuttoned dress shirt adorned with the NASA logo, makes the griffin thirsty. Oh, he swings that way. Maybe he'll actually screw a man that actually drinks Budweiser. He's grateful for his shades. It's easy to turn your head away while keeping your eyes drilled on the prize. He's saluting that goddamn prize. One would guess he's enjoying the pinks and oranges of the setting sun. <laughs> but there's no containing a longing like his. That's a fine man, sure. But it's the shirt that sells it for the griffin. Surely it's just some gift shop memento, but maybe he's an engineer on his day off. He's always had a thing for smart men like that. I'm surprised he <laughs> No offense, but Luke does not look like the guy who has the IQ himself. I'm sorry, I just had to say it. Maybe he has street smarts, who knows. 
what he wouldn't do to taste him. Heal him. Hear him gush over his latest project. The griffin opens another beer and chugs it. If you're gonna just drink multiple Bud Lights, just get a frickin' Budweiser like a real man. I'm out American. I'm out Americaing this American Griffin. <sighs> the Griffin opens another beer and chugs it. Even with eyes closed, he lays a hand on the table and recognizes all the carvings on it dating from decades ago. At times, this Griffin avoids thinking in words. There's a danger in eloquence. But he cannot escape them forever. He checks his phone and scrolls over the messages from his ma and siblings, telling him they wouldn't be able to attend this year. The Griffin sits on the, his picnic table, caressing the carvings he left over the years, and is assaulted by words. Like every American. He calls himself Luke. Today, he is alone with his own thoughts, and nothing is more terrifying. This is the first, uh, this is the first time only one of them came over to watch the launch. For decades now, their tradition was fulfilled without interruption. A yearly visit to Cape Canaveral to watch a launch. He knows that traditions are powerful, for as long as they remain unbroken. But he's here, and hopefully that will be enough to keep it going. Next year, he'll drag everyone along, even if it's the last thing he'll do. Even if, like today, the launch is cancelled at the last minute. Boo! Truth is, seeing the rocket go up is a happy surprise, but is not at all a necessity part, or, but is not at all a necessary part of their tradition. What matters is bringing the family together to remember. The Griffin opens another beer can. He'll keep drinking well into the night. At times, sneaking sideways glances at all those fine, married straight men. Hoping one of them looks back with the same lecherous eyes. If they looked his way, they'd see a painfully average human. An American with hazel hair and somewhat tanned skin. I'm only one of those two things. Sounds like a typical Floridian, if you ask me, though. Luke pats his passport once more. How fragile is the illusion that keeps people from seeing his true form? <laughs> it's his goddamn America passport! <laughs> a simple booklet in his, is his main shield against detection. And that same little notebook is what keeps all these men from looking at the griffin and noticing him. It makes him unnoticeable. Were they to look his way, he'd be like a distant memory. A nondescript human shaped their minds would glaze over. That is a weight all mythical creatures must carry, he knows. Luke thinks back to his childhood, surrounded by more than a dozen siblings. Back at the old farmhouse in the east of Austin. Oh, I have relatives that are around Austin, Texas. <laughs> I think. I'm not sure if they moved. They at least were there at some time. So I've been around that place a couple of times. Heard it started to boom. During summer, the entire family would sleep on the porch to cool off. The kids would become a mass of limbs piled together, breathing in unison. Ah, the boys in one corner, the girls in the other. Luke and his brothers would look up to the stars and trace constellations. Peter, the eldest, would tell the stories behind each one of them. Or make them up, as Luke realized years later when he enlisted to the military and was mocked for thinking Orion was playing a guitar. Tonight, Luke cradles his memories. He'll sleep cuddling his picnic table, looking up to the stars he'll never touch. When he speaks, he has the voice of a schoolboy, and he hears Peter telling him all the made-up stories. One can almost forgive the hardships and temptations of being an adult at such times. 
By the time dawn breaks, he will be a man again on his way home. America! Oh, of course he has a motorcycle. God damn it. Driving scares away the words. One's conscious mind turns off and is all that is left is being in the moment. Pure mechanical memory alongside the scent of his cracking leather seats. Long drives and thousands of miles never scared Luke. Ever since his 20s, 10 hours on the road or more were always welcome. He has a home, a small cottage in the mountains of a flyover state, 40 miles away from the nearest town. That sounds nice and peaceful. Not a single neighbor, human or otherwise. Man, that would be a nice place to live, just all out and be able to own. But all the plumbing and all that stuff is a lot of work to set up. It wasn't worth it, making the effort to build bonds when he would just be forgotten. Excuse me? That was an effort of the passport and all the charms he used. It disguised the griffin as a human, but also made most people prone to forget him. He could never remain there for long. The isolation got to him. But neither did he fare well in cities for long. Being forgotten was too much. The cabin was just a place he had the keys for. His car was a better home. Along with all the traveling over the years, he had learned not to grow attached to any specific vehicle, even if he took care of them like a son. Home was the road in all of its forms. Usually car, but also train, bus, even hitchhiking. As for a bed, his time in the military taught him that the floor is as good as any bed. <laughs> Although, sometimes he has to lay there at night and wondering. If he was in a bed instead, would there be someone beside him? Hmm. Super chat. Oh, Kirby's back. Thank you, Kirby, for donating $2 and saying, OMG, I love this game. Also, sorry, I'm late, Perpy Power. <laughs> Great to see you here. Yeah. Anyway. He looks down to the cup holder to his right. There's his passport. That little blue booklet. His ball and chain. He can't lie to himself. He can't stay long in a single place. But he can't speak the truth either. Words, he knows, are dangerous. For a man such as him, these wordless moments of mechanical memory feel like the closest to paradise he will ever experience. Just do. Be. Don't think too hard about it. A reverie such as this can last days, but it is fragile. All it takes is a single unforeseen shift and it shatters. And that's what happens. Far ahead, something catches Luke's eye. A man walking beside the road. He doesn't think. The impulse to help a stranger just hops to the forefront of his mind. He wants to give him a ride. The car comes to a screeching halt. Luke lowers the passenger's side window and screeches over to the, greet the traveler. Not again! Gene! I can't open things properly. I'm so sorry. I was trying to open up my popcorn. This is awkward. Sorry, it's itchy. Anyway, I'm just gonna pour some out. Here we go. The griffin cranes his neck up and down to take a good look at the man, but speaks before he's even seen his face. Hey, you! You want a ride? The griffin is still praising the man, quite openly, in fact. It's been a few days since he's seen any action, and the last afternoon at Cape Canaveral only revved his boosters. Luke stares openly at the stranger's crotch. And I thought I was horny. 
Now that's a happy surprise, he thinks. It's not every day a handsome hitchhiker packs his own lunch. A thick length of denim-busting sausage. God, am I turning into Luke? Oh no. Super chat. <gasps> Thanks, Perpy, again for $2. How long have you been playing? Um, two and a half hours now. So, yeah, I'm on chapter seven. Well, Luke. One, which is after chapter seven. I decided to go with Coda for being safe, I guess. But yeah, I'm just gonna mute the alert box until we get to a break, just in case, and I'll, if, if I miss any, I'll address them during a break. Anyway, let's keep going. <laughs> now that's a happy surprise, he thinks. It's not every day a handsome hitchhiker packs his own lunch. A thick length of denim busting sausage. Damn it, I read it again. <laughs> now, aren't you a good Samaritan? And don't mind if I do. <laughs> Samaritan. Now that's a word Luke hasn't heard before. He keeps his ignorance to himself. Samaritan? I thought you were American. <laughs> the traveler has a stiff accent with sharp consonants and a chirpy, youthful voice. As soon as he enters, Luke's surprised with how well kempt he is. He smells like fresh laundry. That's an even better surprise. It's never sexy when the car ends up smelling like a garbage truck. The two set off together with the radio blaring a sweet jazz tune. Luke sneaks sideways glances at the fine piece of man, barely able to contain the throbbing need in his pants. Not many people nowadays give rides to just anyone they see on the road. That's very kind of you, uh, Mr. Luke. Just Luke. And what I can say, and what can I say, I don't have the heart to leave someone in the middle of nowhere. I travel a lot, you see. Did a lot of hitchhiking, so I always wanted to try and help out and pay it forward. By the way, mister, I'm afraid I didn't get your name either. Gene, that's what my friends call me. Uh oh, so we're friends already. <laughs> that was quick. Of course, I've been on the road for a good while too. And I appreciate someone who treats travelers properly. People like us ought to look after each other's needs. Hell yeah, sure. I know how to treat a traveler properly. Luke sneaks another sideways glance to Jean and spreads his legs. The bulge of his erection is plain for the traveler to see. He sure could go for a blowjob right now. Given one, that is. It's not easy giving head when you have a beak, but practice makes perfect, and Luke has had a lot of practice. I wonder how that would look as a human for like you just see him trying to suck the dick, but it's just like his mouth is not even in. I don't know. What am I thinking? I'm ah, uh, I'm becoming a heathen. It takes a conscious effort to keep himself from pulling over and going down on Gene. God, he must have a fine dick, he thinks. But it hardly matters what his dick is like. Any dick is good enough, even my. Luke wonders how Gene likes to fuck. Maybe he'll grab the griffin's head and go to town. He might end up with slobber running down his chest and his feathers all ruffled up. That's how a proper fuck ought to... Proper fuck? That's how a proper fuck ought to leave you, he thinks. All disheveled with the taste of cum lingering in your mouth. How oh, how delightful. Or maybe Gene is the type to pull out what he's coming. Or maybe Gene's the type to pull out when he's coming. That'd be fine too, having a load drying on his feathers. It's not like anyone would notice since they are already white. Oh god! But it'd be hot if they did. Everybody needs to bonk Luke in chat. Please bonk Luke in the chat. Luke never bothered hiding how much of a slut he is. It's sexy in its own way. 
he wouldn't mind getting riled either. Bending over the car's burning hood, spreading his legs, and letting the stranger make him into a bitch. Damn, Luke, you're such a fucking bottom. Are you a switch at all? Why is it that every super sexual person here is a bottom? Can we have super sexual tops in these vehicles? And nothing beats driving a, with a load of its. Or nothing beats driving with a load in his guts. <laughs> oh man. I'm getting close to toe fucking levels of bad. <laughs> oh no. I'm just not good at this sex stuff. Why did I do this? But then again, the Traveler has had has such delicate features. It's hard to imagine him as a rough fucker. Maybe he's the kind to make love. The Griffin feels the tension rise in the air. His erection strains against his pants. It won't be long now before a wet patch forms on his crotch. Oh boy. His daydreaming, however, killed the conversation. He wants more of that exotic voice. And to make sure the Traveler is up for it. He must be one of those foreign. He must be one of those weirdo foreigners, Luke thinks. You have a funny accent, Gene. Mind telling me where you're from? Oh, I'm from Europe. But you can probably guess that I don't live there anymore. I work as a delivery man, so I don't ever stop for long in any single place. In fact, that's why I'm here to begin with. I'm making a delivery to a truck stop a few miles ahead. You only have to take me that far. You are American, yes? Is that a Texan accent I notice? Damn right! Born and bred in the Lone Star State and proud veteran to boot! I don't live there anymore, but let me tell you, there's no place quite like it. The men are men for starters, and no food beats ours. Let me just say Tex-Mex slaps. Like, I mean, I'm not much of a Texas barbecue person. I, I can't have my tastes or appreciations for it, but Tex-Mex is where it's at, low-key. Like, mmm, that stuff slaps. I've heard some say New Orleans Cajun food is better. Oh, that's also pretty damn good, too. Fuck. And it is good, don't get me wrong. But nothing compares to our barbecue. Nothing. I've been to Europe. I've had your grub and drank your wine. It ain't too bad. But y'all are too classy and stuck up for your own good. <laughs> back when I was there, I'd have my MREs that. Back when I was there, I'd rather have my MREs rather than the stale bread the French gave us. Oh god, I don't get all the fusses about those baguettes and croissants. Back then, they wouldn't even spare us a pat of butter. <laughs> Never got what's so good about macaroons either. Back when I was in Nancy, they all tasted like cough syrup. French food ain't what it's cracked up to be. The talking makes Luke forget about his raging erection. Gosh darn it. He's used to being silent and avoiding words. But of course, he is almost always on his own and on the move. The prospect of company warms him up and all the words come pouring out. Words are so prickly when you have company. And while some, if not most, would feel intimidated or weirded out by Luke's ramblings, the traveler cracks a smile and nods along. Have you ever been to Texas? You need to try our cornbread. Plus a proper burger with an ice-cold Dr. Pepper. Nah, 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 you gotta have it with a Coca-Cola! Was it with Dr. Pepper? I feel like Coca-Cola is more American. That's just... That might just be me. I don't know, Dr. Pepper could be pretty American. <laughs> I'm like, how American can we get with Luke? Take a drink after he says something American. Oh boy, I'm gonna be so dead after this. 
Pepsi drinkers get the rope. Oh, I am so screwed. Good old Texas barbecue, too. Oh, you have to try it. It's the best in the whole goddamn world, and the rest can suck it. <laughs> I don't know if a fancy pants European like you would appreciate a fine proper burger, though. See one of you trying to eat with a fucking fork and knife? Oh, baloney. Then again, aren't nice band over there in Europe or something? Just like them goddamn memes. Texas will make a man out of you. And if you ever are in Houston, there's so much to see. Mission Control and the Space Center for starters. Oh, they have kick-ass pickle pops. You gotta try those. Ah, more drink. Oh, Lord. Oh, yes, I've been to Texas before, yes. But I admit, I haven't been through all those experiences. I'm sorry. Definitely haven't had any Texas barbecue. I have yet to get that sorted out next time. Can't make such a faux pas again. Now there's another one of those fancy European words, foul paw, thought the griffin. <laughs> if you don't mind me asking, what brought you here to Florida? Oh, it was a family reunion. Ma and all my siblings get together once a year to watch the rocket launch. It's our tradition. But the whole thing went to shit. Everyone was too busy this year. I came anyway, of course. Can't let a tradition die. But even with the launch... But even the launch left me hanging. The whole thing got delayed. It got me so bummed, I decided to just go home early. I usually stop by Fort Lauderdale for a week or two of fun. Uh, but I figured I wasn't in the mood for it. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. At Fort Lauderdale. Now that's a destination if you want to party. Maybe a more relaxing vacation would do you good. Burn! Got him. Enjoy my popcorn, I'm sorry. You've already visited France. I'm sorry that you had a bad experience, but maybe you should try giving Europe another chance. Bruges is a great this time of year. It's like a fairy tale. Is there any place you'd like to visit? Luke thinks before answering. France is out of the question. Same goes for Germany, Italy, perhaps. Or Greece. He's like, I don't, I don't need to go anywhere. I got America. Yeah, that's a place. There's a place. I'm 3.125. 3 3.125% Greek, you know. That's where my family came from 20 or 30 generations ago. I mean, sure. I have a lot of Native American in me, too, from my mom's side. But I've always thought of myself as Greek. I ought to pay Namia a visit someday. See where my ancestors came from. The Nemean lion, Luke thinks. Namian lion. Large is the gap between how a man sees himself and how he is seen by others. The hitchhiker sees a man. A painfully bland mixed race American, but through the rearview mirror, Luke sees his true shape. An enchanted passport is all that keeps his true shape hidden. Plus, don't people say the Greeks were all about butt fucking each other? I've got to see for myself if that tradition still holds. <laughs> and Luke went back to horny. Luke bursts out giggling while Jean watches him quiet. After the Griftons, after the Griftons, after the Griftons' laughter dies down, he gives the man a sideways glance and feels that for the tension in the air. Somber thoughts, however, pass away quickly. 
Fresh needs take over the Griffin's mind. Now that the conversation's been properly ended, the Hornier that's from nearly a week without getting laid throws all his subtlety out the window. He needs dick now! <laughs> and he has a hunch this traveler might swing that way. Hey buddy, you mind if we make a quick stop? I really need to take a leak. Oh god, bathroom butt fucking no! It's your car, my man. You are in charge. I'll take the chance to have a smoke, too. Luke breaks too suddenly, betraying his eagerness. He pockets his passport, checks for oncoming traffic, there isn't any, and leaps out. Oh dear god, is he gonna actually just fuck this guy? <laughs> the Griffin walks over to Gene's side of the car and, with his back towards it, pulls out his dick. <laughs> he smiles when he hears Gene's door opening and closing and then the clicking of a lighter. Luke spreads his legs and raises his tail ever so slightly. He feels the traveler's gaze drilling him from behind. Gene walks up beside Luke and unzips his pants. That makes two, I guess. The Griffin stares at the man's garage and does his best to ignore the smoke. Oh, doesn't that feel just right? Two men pissing outdoors. Gene keeps quiet. You know, I could help with that if you want. Excuse me? You hear me? How about I suck a load out of your dick right here and now? Why are why are the most why are the horniest characters in the VNs I read power bottoms? Can we get any power tops in my VNs? Well, I mean there was Shuichi technically, but we're moving on from that. I don't think you have what it takes. <laughs> Is that so? Oh, I'm kinky. I can take whatever you can dish out. Really? Are you sure about that? Are you sure about that? Luke's expression says it all before the delivery ran. Gene lets out a hearty laugh. Very well. Don't say I didn't warn you. I'm a man of refined, exquisite tastes. I only take in similarly bold men. You see, I like some good old fashioned cock and ball torture. <laughs> oh, the classic cock and ball torture. Zero percent subtlety. I feel so drunk right now, I've only drank in like half of this. I need more, please. Drop your pants, slut. <laughs> Wait, what? You heard me. Drop your pants and embrace yourself. Okay, you're right. That's not my thing. Not so tough now, are you, kitten? I thought you were a man. Can't you take a beating? Dean's bellowing laughter echoes through the wilderness. Wait a minute. I wonder what would happen if we turned off the not safe for work or turn off the safer work mode. Would this sex scene actually happen? I don't want to go deep into it. I was just curious. Okay, not so tough now. Are you kidding? Can't you take a beating? Okay, I thought it was gonna be like a sex scene if it was not safe for work. Okay. Gene's bellowing laughter echoes through the wilderness. I'll have you know I can take whatever you can dish, but I'm not that stupid. Sorry, boy. I just don't get like a. I just don't feel like getting a blowjob. I don't have a ball kicking fetish. I just want to see you backpedaling. You son of a bitch! The tension in the air is diffused in one fell swoop. They zip up amidst their laughter and go back to the truck with arms over each, other's, or over each other's shoulders. There's a chaste, soothing glow between the two of them. The rolling road slows down as Luke begins to near the truck stop. The lot is cracked to its edges, and the gas pumps covers are speckled with red rust. 
No, don't bonk me, bonk Luke. I he's he's the one saying it. The truck stop had its fair share of dust over time. Despite that pale blue paneling and those tarnished window frames, it has remained a roadside hub for the road's regulars. There's still hustle and bustle at the stop after all those years. Truckers talking each other up and down, the lot backside filled by 18-wheelers, the thick black smoke left behind by the pickups as they continue their journeys alongside the road. Nothing quite like it, I swear. Open the window and take a whiff of that air. Ah, pollution. As Luke's truck moves closer to the lot's entrance, Jean rolls down the window and the intermingled smell of gasoline and 24-7 breakfast fills the vehicle. Ugh, oh god. Now that's what I call Americana. Jean coughs hard, his words walking over each other as he quickly rolls the window back up. Oh, that's a... <clears throat> definitely something else. I can safely say. Gene lets out a fizzled and forced laugh, looking a bit sick already. Luke guffaws, he slings an arm over Gene's shoulders, amused by the delivery man's enthusiasm. Right after parking, the two end up leaving the truck laughing like fools, mocking each other and talking dirty while walking. You know, Luke, I wouldn't mind catching you around again sometime soon. Luke's mind falls to the gutter again. <laughs> All subtlety out the window. Not like that, bird brain. I make deliveries along the route often, you see. There's this hotel reopening a bit further down the road, and my employer might send some shipments there soon. I'll be honest, you look like you could use some time off. None of that Fort Lauderdale party life. I mean a place to cool down for a while. If you do stay there for a while, I'm sure we'll end up seeing each other again. And I'd like that. Oh, I would. Oh, really now? I'll have you take up take you up on that then. Ain't too common you make friends on the road. And I mean friends that show up at the same diner or rest stop more than every three weeks. It's not easy to make conversation with someone you don't see much. Especially when half the time they barely remember you. What? People have a hard time remembering you? I find that hard to believe. You're very remarkable. Ah, it's complicated. You'll see for yourself. It's easy forgetting the people you meet on the road. It's not something we have control over. I must respectfully disagree. I have no issue at all remembering the people I've met on my travels. Well, you'll see. I won't forget you, kitten. Especially if you stay a while in that hotel I mentioned. I'll be around there plenty. Someone has to drop crates at that dusty place. We'll see, Luke thanks. Already aware of human folly. The goddamn passport on his pocket will make sure Gene forgets about him. The two arrive at the manager's office, right by the rest stop's diner. I have to drop this package off, but you should try to get a room there. It certainly looks like it needs the guests. I'll think about it. Hotels can make your wallet drier than the Chihuahuan. Well, it is reopening just now. Wouldn't surprise me if they're doing some kind of low rate for the first few guests. Just give me a call or text sometime. The two exchange numbers quickly before Gene extends his hand over to Luke, offering a gentleman's handshake. It was nice meeting you, Luke. He'll see you around, okay? Luke bats the hand away and gives Gene a heavy-handed pat on the back, almost knocking the poor man over. Now this isn't how you say goodbye to a friend. You take it easy, partner. <laughs> the two break apart and wave goodbye as they walk away from each other. A man can dream of being remembered and making friends. Hope is delectable on its own, especially when it's foolish. Luke has a smile stretched on his face before taking notice of something more pressing. His hunger. 
He might as well reward himself for being the good Samaritan he is. He turns away from his truck and heads towards the diner. Ah, uh, there he is. The jingle of the door's bell announces Luke's entrance. A wrinkly-faced waitress welcomes him at, from the counter and asks for his order. Pen in hand. Hell, will just take a coffee and two donuts if you got any. Sure thing, hon. You got co you get comfortable, okay? Luke looks around briefly and notices there aren't too many seats that aren't worn to their stuffing. The only seat, a stained but plush bar stool, lies tight between two other men. The frames are wide enough to overlap at the empty seat. Luke might as well make room for himself. He walks his way over to the seat, and with a quick pardon, the two scoot themselves away so that he can sit. Even still, the bird is almost sandwiched between the two bulky men. Not long after sitting down, a dish with two fresh donuts and a steaming cup of coffee is set right in front of the griffin. Luke wastes no time and starts sipping at his coffee. Strong in taste and smell, it's something that he'll love until his feathers fall out. Just as he starts to eat, a stuffy snort comes from behind him and catches his attention. He glances to his side. Of course. God damn it. A bulky beast of a man reading from the paper. Sleeveless shirt showing off that he definitely has some muscle to him. <sighs> the army taught Luke how to use his peripherals, and he savors each glance he gives the man. Especially the peeks he takes out his crotch. Nothing that would set my rocks off, the Sly Eagle thinks to himself. Trucker's always packed down there. With all that extra testosterone that comes with the job, it must go somewhere. Another bite of the donut travels down his throat and Luke glances over once more. The large trucker scratches his exposed crack, unbothered by the fact that others are around. The sight scratches Luke's itch, too, arousing him even more. His donut dips into the coffee, and Luke glances over to the other side this time. An old trucker wasting no time scarfing down a burger. His truck uniform hugs his belly right and tight before leading up to his unbuttoned, scruffy collar. But Griffin tugs at his own fly, making his tent more obvious. Now to catch either man's attention, Luke turns his head a bit and stares at the hulkish men. Not long after, the man peers back over and meets his gaze, then grunts and looks back to his paper. Luke looks back down at his food, then over to stare again. The man lowers his paper a bit and takes longer to look at the eagle. He smirks before pulling his paper up again. Two minutes pass before Luke takes another look and catches the man looking him down before winking at him. Luke lightly kicks the man's foot, and the brute's knees reflectively spread apart wider. He eyes, the he, eye he eyes the tent hidden below the counter's edge. The griffin has it down to an art at this point. Luke chuckles quietly, finishes up his meal, and looks over to the bathroom, a squat building across the parking lot. He looks back at the brute, tilts his head at the direction of the building, then scoots out to head over. Discreet and simple. He listens and hears two deep voices murmuring right behind him. Eagle eyes and hearing are something that he finds useful even after his time in the military. Luke waits outside by the dumpster until he sees the trucker making his way to the restroom. After a minute, Luke follows. I wonder what happens if I turn this off. Witness regretful things. Okay, you might have to bonk me for this. Okay. I can witness regretful things without any consequence. From the doorways, blah blah blah. I'm not gonna read this part out loud. Maybe I should read this part as like my net, my Patreon thing. Speaking of which, you can donate to my Patreon and hear me read not safe for work stuff. Hmm. 
I'm gonna save this for the Patreon, but I'm just gonna glance through it quickly. It is damp. The floor is sticky. I'm just gonna briefly highlight it. There are three stalls to the left. There are urinals. Look, it's in there, and there's a trucker dick out already. <laughs> What's this? Four. I mean, as far from being an athlete, he carries quite some batting, but has a wide build that someone's been lifting heavy loads for years now. Eyes obscured by a baseball cap, who glimpses his stubble in the face. He's got a wife beater. Sharp musk of a man, oh god, it's musk! Ah! Let's see what happens. He strides up to him and takes his dick out as well. The stroking salivate. Of course, Luke salivates at the sight. Fine. A thick fat mushroom head with a bean of pre Oh my god. The pre. Yes, I'm very selfish. I'm sorry. Do the might. They do things. They're teasing. Oh god. Luke says something. How long it's been for you? Or how long is how long's it been for you? The trucker's toothy smile is a single streak of what? <laughs> the bathroom's darkness. Yeah, in days. You better be ready. I'm not gonna read it all. I need to remind myself to save at this point. Sorry, save. I'm gonna save at this point just so we. Just so I can read it for my patrons. Okay, the things happen. Sorry, I just came back to where I was. Yeah, something in days. Another drop of whatever falls from his thing, my bob. Another. <laughs> Again, Luke does a thing. He looks directly into the man's eyes. And does a thing. There's a danger in eloquence. Who knows? The comfort in having your voice silence. Then there's another dirty thing. Then another dirty thing. Dirty talk. His mind goes blank. He pries it open. Oh boy. Oof. That is some censored stuff. Oh, he gets dirty. Kinky stuff, I'm just gonna start fast forwarding. What? Oh, he wants him. Okay. <laughs> of course. They start doing it. Oh man, things are happening. I'm just fast forwarding. Oh boy. And it happens. Oh god. Oh god, things happen. Oh boy, I am witnessing very regrettable things. Yes. Oh, I thought it was actually gonna be a sex scene. Okay, he's naked. Oh, so he is an actual griffin. I can't think he was just an eagle for some reason. Footsteps. Gets dirty. Honestly, his body knows. Yeah. Dirty things. Oh god. There's two of them now. What the? What the? What the? I am witnessing very regrettable things. We are fast forwarding through this. Still fast forwarding. Who realize who's fast forward. Okay, moving on. Okay, keep going. How regrettable was that? Okay, I wonder if this is the part that comes out if we avert our eyes. So, 
Sensor is being removed, everybody. Sorry, I just was way too tempted. Yeah, it is a bit much. So let's avert our eyes this time. Men and their own sightly wants. Many of their seducted sins, unrestrained deeds, disgraceful desires, or fleeting pleasures they embrace under the cover of darkness. One can imagine what such fiery men can do. And what regrets take them there when the beating of their hearts is no longer the only song thundering in their ears. I'm afraid for this one will take a while for the song to end. The more men find their way into the restroom and then they dwell. As for us witnesses, there is nothing to do but twiddle our thumbs until well past sundown. Too often nothing can be done but avert a man from his regrettable choices. The silence of one's mind often acts as a shield. His mind must be quiet, focused only in pure mechanical perfection, while the scene unfolds around him. The smell of detergent at all throbbing want of the arc of his back, his eyes are soft and needy, wanting guidance, reassuring hand. Here and there between grunts, unwelcoming memories intruding of similar escapades, but worse yet, familiar faces of the dearly departed. His beak with the little nick and his tail bent at the end. What do you think seeing Lucas like this? Face against the tiled floor. Did he imagine seeing like something like this when he first heard the news? Perhaps he did. Even if Luke was like this when it all happened, you have guessed it was a sick twist of fate. Luke tries to push these thoughts away. This is not the time. Let's me enjoy it. He looks very disappointed. <laughs> Luke arrives at the cafeteria and asks for a cup of coffee. The look of disgust in the cashier's eyes makes it clear he knows exactly what Luke is up to, and that he's not welcome to drip cum on their floor. Oh, I forgot. Save for work mode. The cashier slides a styrofoam cup over, even if Luke didn't order it to go. He takes it and goes outside to sit back to hide beside the dumpster and look at the stars. His shaking hands spill half the cup's contents. The stinging heat doesn't even register. Griffin tells himself it'll be fine once he's tracing the constellations. He'll feel like a kid, and it'll be like being back at Cape Canaveral all over again. He's about to turn the corner when the cigarette stench hits him. The idea of being seen right now brings him no spark of excitement at all. Were he in more control of himself, he would have spun his heel and walked away. You again. But his mind is slow, his legs move on their own, and he stumbles on none other than Gene enjoying a cigarette. It's dark. Maybe he won't see how much of a disgrace I am, thanks the Griffin. And the smoke might hide the scent. Maybe he won't recognize me in the dark. But it only makes a moment for Gene to figure out who it is. Luke, is that you? Oh, I thought you had gone already. What are you doing here? Luke has to piece together Gene's answer, then muster together a response, word by word. I wasn't feeling too good, so I took a nap in my car. I just woke up and I went for a cup of coffee. Oh, is that so? The Griffin's voice sounds sketchy and gravelly. Scratchy and gravelly. He can't stop himself from coughing his lungs out. Funny, I had noticed your car was still parked. But I didn't see you there till when I passed by. He takes a long drive from his cigarette and lets his words linger. Luke sits on the ground and shrinks into himself and he cradles his coffee. He dares not look at Jean. At that silhouette and that burning tip of the cigarette shining. It seems like you're catching a cold too. You sound, pardon my bluntness, like shit. Luke steps on his coffee hoping it will give him enough time to recompose himself. But silence lingers, gnawing away at him. Jean holds out for an answer until it becomes too much for the griffin. And what are you doing here? Weren't you supposed to have left by now? Oh, my ride had a few issues. It'll take one more hour or so to arrive. So here I am, waiting, watching truckers come and go. Lots of commotion tonight. 
Griffin's mind crashes and sways like the waves. He remembers how pleasant it was talking with Jean before. He just wishes he had that again. Like earlier in that day, Luke acts before thinking. As the words leave his mouth, he already regrets them. I can give you a ride again. You're good company. I enjoyed the talk. How about that? Luke's stomach sinks, however, as he realizes there will be no way to hide how much he's stinking. Jean will learn, if he hasn't already, what Luke is. Slowing off his sexual conquest used to make him proud, but not tonight. Very kind of you, buddy. But I am going back the way I came. Plus, you look like you really need a rust. Do you really remember what I told you? There's a hotel up ahead. Supposedly it's reopening. Maybe you could stay a while. Seems like you need it. Is there someone waiting for you back at home? <sighs> no, I live on my own. And any reason to return quickly? A job? Family? Obligations? Luke goes back to his coffee and Jean takes the hint. <sighs> Maybe I should, yeah. I sure could use some peace and quiet. A change of scenery. There's a shower here. It's for employees, but I'm buddies with the owner. I have the key with me. I'm sure he'd be fine with you using it. Yeah, I could use a shower. Jean hands him the key. I suppose I should give you privacy just now. Jean stops his cigar. That was a cigarette. Whatever. Actually, if you don't mind, would you... Talk with me for a while longer. Do you know about the constellations? Names and their stories? Uh, would you be okay if we talked about them? Look, there's Orion. It's hard seeing Jean's face, but even if his eyes are covered in shadows, there is a glimmer. Sure, Luke. I know how to read the stars. It's useful. I'll tell you all about them. But you promise me you're going to take a break? Whatever you want, as long as you keep talking. Much has changed since Luke was a boy. No more sleeping on a porch in a pile with his brothers. No more listening to the radio after Dad got back from work. No more stargazing with Peter. He's a grown man now, covered in sex and knee-deep in self-loathing. Struggling not to spill coffee from his styrofoam cup while sitting behind its dumpster. The shower will wash away all the gunk, but Jean's voice cleans his mind. When Luke closes his eyes, he can pretend it's Peter, his brother. The griffin struggles not to fall asleep. When Jean's ride arrives, the two say goodbye. It's laconic, even sorrowful. Luke even takes his shower and naps in his car, looking out to the stars through the windshield. He's too tired to drive right now. Tonight he holds on to the voice of his brother, like he's still a boy. When the morning arrives, he'll be a man again. On his way to the hotel he promised to check into. Luke adjusts the rear view mirror. His eyes flash for a moment. He doesn't appreciate seeing himself like that, coming out of nowhere. Mirrors, he knows, are dangerous. <laughs> engine revs once, twice, thrice for good measure. Luke's claws dig into the steering wheel's leather. The early morning sunlight coming through the windshield warms his chest and grazes his beak. He takes off. Sweet, mechanical memory. It hardly takes a minute for the griffin to start humming a tune. A fine jazz hit. Washing off all that gunk, a good night's sleep in the back seat, and Jean's talk got him back up and running. Yeah, he could use some time in a different scenery. Jean was right. It's not like he has anything better to do. Or a job. The scenery shifts quickly. Just as easily as Luke jumps from one tune to the next. He speeds up until the car is trembling and its individual parts are shaking. Threatening to come undone. More. More of the sweet danger. We have gone further were it not for the bulky shape about a minute up ahead. How do you not notice it sooner in this flat desert? 
He takes his foot off the gas pedal and allows the inertia to carry him forward. He's still going fast enough that, when he takes a right turn into the parking lot, the car swerves and the griffin is pushed against the door. He cackles with his forehead pressed against the window. The car comes to a halt precisely over the line separating two rows of parking slots. Luke has broken his record by using not one, not two, not three, but six spaces simultaneously. <sighs> what am I going to do with you? His car's stereo still blares jazz when he steps out of it, and he slams the door to the beat of his song. The tune is no more, but the griffin crosses the wide expanse of the parking lot, still humming the song. Tell me his footsteps to the beat. He climbs the steps, clinking his claws on the handrail. The doors swing open as he lays his weight on them. And then he seals the deal with a final push that slams them into the walls behind. What's up, fuckers? <laughs> Luke's arrival is like a judge's gavel silencing the world around him. And in the ensuing emptiness, his stride still follows the jazz beat. Ever since he set out earlier in the morning, he's had this contagious spring in his step. At any given moment, he could burst out in laughter or dance. But now, as his eyes adapt to the newfound indoor lighting and he sees the man behind the reception desk, Luke's attitude changes. Luke takes off his glasses. Hey, you! Yes, sir? What the fuck happened to your face? Did a dog chew on it? Uh, I I excuse me? You heard me. What happened to your face? And what kind of fancy thing did you do to get an LED in your skull like that? <sighs> the Minotaur looks down, stuttering an inaudible response. He bites his lip hard and a rivulet of cold sweat runs down his back. Jesus, if you want to look like some cartoon character, you don't have to rip half your face off. <sighs> Luke's stride covers half the distance between them before the Minotaur has a chance to think up an answer. Griffin puts both of his hands on the desk and leans forward. He keeps his gaze locked in the Minotaur's empty eye socket, examining the flickering flame inside. What a weird little thing you are. What even are you? The Minotaur looks away and covers his face without a second thought. His entire back is covered in cold sweat now. I, I, I am sorry, uh, I know I am. And in a flash, Luke's contained laughter bursts out like a dam. Hell, I'm just messing with you, buddy. You should have seen your face right there. Now that must have been one nasty fight you got into. But I've seen him been through worse. I know how it is. You wouldn't know it's seeing as I don't have any scars to show. But yeah, I've been through tough shit. He even been blown away once or twice. Uh, you know, those old timey stick style grenades. Hurt like a bitch. And there was that one time in... Oh, look at me. I almost went on one of my rambles. I could spend all day talking about it being such a fine piece of prime Angus steak as yourself. Well, doesn't matter. I want to book a room here. This place makes me pretty good, right? The Minotaur stumbles at the mention of the hotel. His gaze shows a blossoming warmth, despite all Luke's thrown at his face. Ah, uh, yes. It's quite a marvelous hotel. And I guarantee you it will improve. It's very empty now, but it's sure to change in just a few days. I'll hold you to that. So, where do I sign? What are your rates? Oh, yes. Uh, just sign here in the ledger and fill in these forms. This is our soft opening. We won't charge you, good sir. Oh, so this place is fancy and cheap. <laughs> What's the catch? Oh, shit. Luke just farted. Luke, that's very rude. Sorry, chat. 
Excuse me, all that Bud Light. Oh. So this place is fancy and cheap. What's the catch, then? I am sorry to say there is no catch. <laughs> this place has a mansion, you see. This place has a mansion. This place has a mission, you see. And, well... We don't ever charge much. A, a mission? Yeah, some sort of charity. I suppose, in a way, to put it, yes. At least it was for a good while. It's up to the owner. Luke has been checked into your hotel. You can see your current guests in the guest screen in the menu, or clicking into the ledger icon. Luke hands over the forms. The Minotaur takes a cursory glance at them. Mr. Lucas Walker, born in October 1923. Damn, you are an old man. You are fucking old. Damn, you are so old. Do you like it when I make fun of you, Griffin? Anyway, your looks are quite misleading. I never guessed your age. You'd even be old enough to. Oh, you know how it is. Griffins don't age like Humies do. And I'm from a fine lineage, you see. I'm 3.125% Greek. And my papa was just like me in that regard. Barely aged. Ah, I see. Uh, I'm sorry, I admit I'd never met a griffin before. I don't know how it is, I'm afraid. Well, I can say that, I can say the same. Never saw a minotaur myself. I thought you guys were some old Greek legend. Crichton. Excuse me? A Crichton story, not a Greek. Greece, do Greece didn't exist when it all happened. About 3,000 years before Christ. Ah, forgive my impertinence. Here is your key, Mr. Walker. Your room is just down the hall. I hope you have an enjoyable stay here with us. Oh, I'm sure I will. And I hope I get to have a taste of Angus B someday. Jesus Christ, Lucas, what the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> and that's the end of that chapter. I think I need to save here just because it's getting kind of late for me. So, I think I'm going to end things here tonight, so... Uh, that was a good reading. Unfortunately, I don't want to, like, overkill myself at this point. Oh man, it's been an hour, jeez. Over an hour. Oh boy. So, let's go to the title screen. Well, that is the end of episode 3 of Minotaur Hotel, so we got through chapters 5 through 7, so I'm happy about that. I mean, I wish I could have made a little more progress, but I kind of got sidetracked and life, and just, it's getting late. And I have to kind of finish my late night snack up before a certain time because I need to fast for a certain number of hours for tomorrow. But yeah, I mean, I'm starting to enjoy this novel and at least there is some character to Luke where it's like, he's not all just, not completely, <laughs> I'm sorry, not completely an asshole, but you know, there's something to him, at least. At least that's kind of what I learned. Ah, looking forward to how this all goes down. But yeah, maybe I'll do it this week. Maybe I'll continue it next week if no one of my other novels update. Unfortunately, Minotaur Hotel and Will Star Sins in Paradise, since they don't update as frequently and I'm more behind on them, they're more of my backburner novels compared to the monthly updated novels. So yeah, that's how it be sometimes. But yeah, I'm looking forward to continuing this novel and just... Yeah, I'll take things one step at a time. So, before we go, I want to thank my patrons. <laughs> well, I know that I'll download this via Dirk. Aw, that's cool, Amaral. Looking forward to that. 
But anyway, before we go, I'm wanting to thank my patrons. Whoosh. There we go. I want to thank all my patrons. They helped me afford those, like, edited videos, my commissions for my VM, for stuff for my Patreon to help, you know, make more incentives for it, whether it is the early access to my VN updates, not safe for work exclusives, maybe I'll put that scene in there as one of those, which I didn't fully read, but I'll probably go back and read if I do so. But yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I heard supposedly the smoke room, rumor has it, has one coming up, so... You know, maybe we got a little something something going on with that, so... Here we go. I want to thank my fellow dorks, starting off with them, my $3 and above tier, North Grizz, Andrew Corona, Nick Tanner, Taipei Roth, Norbert Dudzik, Sion, Mogram Wolfram, and the Dewey Nguyen. And I want to give a very, 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 very special thanks to my $10 and above tier, my exclusive dorks, Fire Knight 2008. These are the people that help me fund what I do and support what I love. And along with your generous donations in the YouTube chat and whatnot, y'all help me make this work out and whatnot. It's so enjoyable. And once 